Welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Well, the cat decided to sit still long enough for me to do a video, so, uh, yeah, let's read some stories while he takes a nap. C-3PO and art don't mix. This is an oldie, but the last couple summers of high school, I worked under the table for an accountancy office. Fact 1. After high school, I worked retail in an office supply store for a couple years. Fact 2. And was headhunted for a Mac support position at an online catalog retailer. I started training the week after Thanksgiving. I got on the phones the week between Christmas and New Year's 1999. I was seated at the desk of the Mac trainer, because shadow training was a thing then. One of the first calls I had was from a woman who had received a brand new iMac and printer for Christmas. She was a worship leader of some sort at her church and was trying to print out something inspiring and heartwarming because the winter of 99 was a bad one wherever she was, and she wanted to evoke spring early in the new year. Except the graphics she was adding to her newsletter weren't showing up. We reinstalled drivers. We reinstalled her publishing software. We tried different USB ports. Even tried going through the keyboard USB port. We tried cleaning the print cartridges, even though they, like the printer, were brand new and the cleaning cycle on Epson inkjets at the time were tremendously wasteful processes. We tried replacement ink cartridges because someone had the foresight to send her extras. At this point, I've got both support managers listening into the call, both trainers leaning over my shoulder, and a good handful of the team milling about trying to offer suggestions. I was about to process an RMA for the printer when something she stated out of pique caught my attention. Church lady, I just don't get it. Where the graphic is supposed to be is wet. Needless to say, she never mentioned this before. Me latching onto that. Say that again, please. What do you mean wet? Church lady. Well, it's a newsletter, which I think I've already said. I just love flowers. Daisies are my favorite. So I wanted a few daisies on the page for springy feelings, you know? Me. Ma'am, out of curiosity, are your daisy images black line art? Church lady. Oh no, honey, they're full color. Just a beautiful yellow. You wouldn't know they weren't photographs. This technology is so amazing. Me. And you say the page is wet? By this point, her frustration had waned, and she's just answering questions in between stories about her church, her grandkids, etc. Church lady. Yeah, right where the flower is supposed to be. Light bulb moment. Me. Ma'am, what color is your paper? Church lady. Why, goldenrod, of course. Me. Ma'am, you can't print yellow flowers on a yellow paper. That's like using a blue crayon on blue construction paper. It just won't work. I had to mute my phone because all the people laughing behind me. Later, someone asked me how I knew what in the hell color goldenrod was. <laughs> well, outside of C-3PO being called that as a nickname pretty consistently in Star Wars, I'd worked with facts 1 and 2, all different colors of color-specific corrective liquid. One was goldenrod, and it was a mix of near-nuclear yellow and orange. You know, regular consumer printers, you know, people trying to print white on white, white on any color, uh, yellow on yellow, blues on blue. You kind of got to think your way through the process. But she was new, so I mean, it's not like she was stupid or anything. She just, it's not something that was in her processes at that time. So hopefully she understood after that and got herself together. And good for you, OP, for being patient with this lady and uh, sticking with her long enough to finish it out. Woman doesn't listen to my warning before accidentally bashing her head open with an amplifier. I used to work for a company that supplies overhead music to big business chains. Think Target, Starbucks, Hot Topic, etc. My department provides technical support to stores when their music isn't working. Now, I don't have a lot of tech service stories because of how our system works. When something goes down in the store, we're not talking to some area manager, Karen, who's ready to scream at us for the music being down. Rather, we have to troubleshoot with the stores themselves. So if we're calling a Starbucks location, it's going to be some uninvested barista or assistant manager that couldn't care less if their system isn't blaring. All I want for Christmas is you 20 times a day. Mind you, that does mean that we have a hard time getting the people at the store to troubleshoot with us at all. So was the case with the Starbucks I called. The first three attempts went something like this. OP. Hey there, my name's OP from insert company name here. I'm reaching out today regarding your overhead music. Is manager available to talk? Store manager. This is her. When's the technician coming out? OP. Unfortunately, I'm unable to send a tech out unless I verify some things with the system first. Do you have time to remote troubleshoot? Store manager. No, just send a tech. Click. This happened a few times over the course of two days, trying to call at all different times to try and catch the store at a less busy time. Unfortunately, due to company policy, we can't send a technician out except for under two conditions. One, new equipment needs to be installed. And two, there's an issue that can't be solved remotely. 
Eventually, on my fourth or fifth call, the manager finally relented. Once we get the store to agree to troubleshoot, it generally only takes five minutes. We have very simple setups. A music player connects to the internet for playlist updates and also feeds music to an amplifier. The amp sends the music to the speakers in the store. If you can hook up a video game console, you can hook up one of our players. And even the least tech savvy person can usually follow along with our instructions for troubleshooting. So we begin. Me. Great, are you able to locate your music player and amplifier? Store manager. No, I don't know where they are. Me. Have you ever changed the volume of the music in your store? Store manager. Yes, there's a box with a little knob. Me. That's the amplifier. Store manager. Well, how was I supposed to know that? I rolled my eyes and apologized for not being clearer, but continued anyway. Store manager. It's up on a shelf too high. I can't reach it. Me. Well, how do you reach it when you want to change the volume? Store manager. I get a step stool, but I don't know where it is right now. I try my best not to sigh in exasperation as she tries her very best to insist that there's no way she can troubleshoot. She just repeatedly asks if I can send a tech and whines about not being able to reach the equipment. Ma'am, I'm sure you'll find the step stool if you look. Store manager. Fine then, I'll just use my chair. Huge red flag went up. Me. I'd advise against that, ma'am. It might not be stable. Store manager. I think I'm perfectly capable of standing on a chair, thank you. Me. Ma'am, some of that equipment is very heavy and it's not safe to use a chair to reach it for troubleshooting. Store manager. Listen, why don't you stick to doing your job and not worry about what I'm doing, okay? After she says this, I hear some skidding noises coming from the other end of the phone. Me. Uh, is everything alright? Store manager. I'm fine, just rolling my office chair to the shelf. Oh my god. <laughs> me. Man, please don't stand on a chair with wheels. She ignored me completely and just asked, Okay, so what am I? She was abruptly cut off as I hear a loud thud followed by an even louder crash. Me. Ma'am, are you okay? No answer. I try in vain for about a minute to call out to the woman on the other end, steadily getting more and more worried that she's seriously injured. Eventually, someone else picks up the phone. Barista. Hey, so, uh, she can't come back to the phone right now. Her forehead is bleeding. Me. What happened? So not only did she fall off the chair onto her back, but she had brought the amplifier with her. Our amplifiers are about the size of an Xbox, and the corners are not rounded. It had landed on its corner on her forehead while she was lying prone on the ground. Oh my gosh. After a few moments of stunned silence, not knowing where to go from here, I simply ask, Is the amp disconnected from everything else? <laughs> Barista. Uh, yeah. Me. Cool, then this counts as an install. I'm sending a technician. Have a nice day. Click. I take a moment to recover before going back to making outbound calls. Luckily, the store never calls to complain about the interaction, and I continue on with my day acting as if it never happened. Listen, I ain't no spring chicken, and I learned ages ago to not stand on something that's mobile. Nothing with wheels. TV carts, office chairs, no matter what. You don't use something with wheels to stand on to reach something up on a shelf. Regular chair is bad enough. Look at that cat. He looks so peaceful like that, doesn't he? Just about the time I'm ready to go to sleep tonight is when he'll just decide that it's time to tear my desk apart, rip up and down the hall with his brother and sister, yeah. Stupidity isn't always from users. In this company, a higher education establishment, IT contractors were more the rule than the exception. Management had some queer, it's best we get some experts in, attitude. Anyway, there was me, ASP.NET, IIS, SQL Server, MS Full Stack, and a bunch more, covering nearly all bases. The in-house people were mostly field engineers. Imagine our chagrin when an email came in for all ICT contractors that due to an administrative error, our times hadn't gone through, so we wouldn't be getting paid until next week. It was from some woman in payroll, the type that's fresh out of college, more interested in that cute guy in accounting and her hair than in doing her job. To say the crap hit the fan would be like saying water's wet. And the contract were, as standard, terms of termination. One of them was, should the company be late providing recompense, for a period greater than 48 hours from the end of the agreed weekly date, the company defaults with all liability and the employment terminates in its exact entirety. Defaulting with liability is a termination of contract with all money owed and would be payable. The entire wages for the contract. Some of us had all possible bonuses included with that. Some didn't. So we get together and I draw the short straw and I'm elected to speak for all of us. Always do things collectively, people. Don't take on an HR department of 100 people by yourself. I get in touch with the head of ICT and read out that line of the contract. He stopped, read it himself, 
then called payroll to confirm it was true, reading out the contract and then stating what the damage to the company would be. He then retired to his office. The company's options then were to either get us paid, to default on the contracts and pay us off, or to be in breach of contract. With how many of us there were and our wades, the latter option would have been into the low millions with punitive damages added to the lost wages and fines. A plain as day claim against a company via tort law rarely ends well for the company. Breach of contract frequently attracts punitive damages. In employment cases, it also attracts fines. It's a far more expensive prospect than even a wrongful dismissal claim. Now the head of ICT had a lovely air-conditioned soundproof office, but I could see his face very red and his mouth very shouting. Whoever was on the other side of the phone was not enjoying themselves. This guy, who sat at an executive level, was going berserk. He came out, closed the door neatly behind him, adjusted his tie, and cleared his throat. I'm sorry people, the call you got earlier was an error, but let me explain. Some useless excuse of humanity and payroll who we used to employ did indeed make a mistake. Then she made a further mistake by not telling her supervisor and going straight to you. I just got off the phone with her supervisor with assurances that the problem, both problems, that is the idiot and payroll and your fair pay, both problems are solved. He's a pretty off the cuff guy but can put on a good speech when he wanted to, but he knew he was dying to laugh. We all burst out laughing after a few seconds. True enough, the moron office admin woman got fired for gross negligence and the payroll supervisor got written up for letting it happen. As she explained later, even though we were contractors, we were his team. And he wasn't about to let anyone screw you over and get away with it. That's my job. <laughs> I, think, I think that last part was a little bit tongue in cheek, but you never know. I yell at my kids. I don't let anybody else yell at my kids. That's my job. I guess the same thing goes for some company departments. Somebody's dreaming. Cat showed up, so I guess it's time to read a story. Hit my breaking point today. Quick background. I work for a very large computer company that ships servers worldwide. I'm in charge of RMA, RCA, and will try to help customers online to avoid returns. Last month, customer orders a series of systems with an older operating system which is close to end of life, even after being spoken to about this at length. Once systems are installed, the customer decides to update BIOS to a non-approved version and breaks the logging process. Fan sensors no longer reporting. Customer calls in ticket on Friday. I spent all weekend creating a patch to fix the issue. This morning, customer refuses to install the patch or cold boot the systems and wants to replace all servers at my company's cost. It's only 9 a.m. and I'm already done for the day. Yeah, it sounds like somebody there was given a little too much power in decision making and uh, goofed up. Hey, it's on them though. You explained it to them. They bought and signed contracts or whatever. Knowing all this information, you have the email trail hopefully to prove it. And, uh, screw them. You even spent extra time creating a patch for the whole thing, and they're refusing to even do that. So, meh. Time to let them go. And then we waited to go to prison. Dear Diary, December 10th, 1998. I don't like Bubba. Can I get a different cellmate? P.S. Bubba isn't as nice to me as Tammy was. Our shop had a sister store, the parent store, in a nearby city. We rarely ever saw staff from the other store and more rarely saw the owner. In the one year I worked there, I saw the owner twice. That said, we did a lot of business for a semi-rural county and we sold lots of white box PCs to local businesses. We also sold lots of software, lots and lots of software. One day in the late spring, several cases of software showed up along with the proof for next week's newspaper ad. 200 copies of Office 97 Professional and according to the ad, it's on sale starting the next week for $219? Holy guacamole. I bought one. The manager bought one. All the employees bought one. Our friends and family. It was a Clip ETM love fest. The ad hit on Tuesday, if I recall correctly, and we sold every copy by Friday. We figured it was a one-shot deal, but we called up the mothership and asked if there were more coming, and to our amazement, more were already en route. We got another 200 plus copies. The sale ran for one more week, and at the end of that week, they went to regular price of $249? We were told the boss got a really good deal. That lasted for months. Our sale price became the normal price. We had a bank call up and order 150 copies. Another local business ordered 200. For the first two or three months, we sold out almost every week. Then it slowed down to a steady 10 to 20 copies a week. With that volume of sales, you expect the occasional call of, hey, I'm trying to reload my office and it isn't reading the disks. 
For the average single copy owner, we would tell them to swing by and, and we'd give them another copy we burn if they brought us their Office 97 box with the license key. But then one day we got this call. Customer, hey, this is Ann over at business and I'm trying to load Office on a new machine and the disk isn't working. Tech one, oh yeah, that happens sometimes. Just open another box and use that disk. Customer, I did that. I've tried five of them now and they're all doing the same thing. Failing on disk two reading the same file. Tech one internally. Yeah, sure they are. You didn't open a new box. You're just lazy. Huh, that's weird. Maybe they had a bad batch of resin or scratch when they were being pressed. Well, tell you what, swing by and we'll give you a copy of disc two that works. Customer. Great. See you in a bit. Some days pass. Junior tech. Hey, I got a call from other business and they couldn't get their office to reinstall. Tech one. Did you tell them to clean the CD drive or try another disc? Junior tech. Yeah, they did that and they said they tried several discs from other boxes and they all did the same thing. Tech 1. That's weird. Hey, sample size? Tech 1 relays the story to me. So I asked the other two techs and lo and behold, we've all had quite a few of these calls over the last few weeks. I called the parent store and talked to the purchasing manager. He tells me they just found out there was a big run of bad discs pressed and they'll send us several cases of new office discs to replace the bad one. Okay. Two days later, the company van shows up, driven by the parent manager, and unloads six large cases of all-new retail Office 97. I think there were 144 units per case. Manager. Yeah, so owner just wanted to recall the others, so you need to call all the business customers and get them to swap out their boxes for these ones. Us. What the hell? Do you know how much work that'll be? Manager. Not my problem. That's what owner said. We have to do the same thing. Have fun. Us. Giving him glares of death. Start making calls. As businesses start bringing in their copies, or more usually having us come on site and swap them out, Junior Tech decides to pop open one of the new boxes for some reason. Junior Tech. Hey sample size, take a look at this. Does this look weird? Shows me Office 97 CD with a visibly off-center label and you can see the ink dots on the label from the printing process. SS. Uh, where did you get that? Junior Tech. From this box right here. One of the new ones manager brought last week. SS, go grab a couple of the returns and another new box from a different case and open them all up. Lay all the discs on the counter. Junior Tech, sure, what's wrong? SS, I think we're all going to prison. <laughs> Junior Tech, Tech 1, and Tech 2. Wait, what? Epilogue, so after local manager had a few calls with parent manager and the owner told us not to worry about it, some decisions were made by some people at the parent store to collect lots of documentation and make a couple of other phone calls. Apparently the owner had connected with some guy who could get software at a really good price and thought this was a great way to make a fast buck. I heard a couple years later via the rumor mill the owner was somewhere in Central or South America. I believe there were at least two warrants out for him. Yeah, it's always a good idea to hook up with a guy who knows a guy. Software piracy ain't no joke, guys. And judging by how many cases and discs they were talking about, uh, that guy could be facing some serious time. <laughs> Bubba. Image Resolution I work for MSP level 1, 2, and 3 because they expect us to do it all and recently heard my boss tell someone that I handle level 4 issues. Not sure what 4 does, but I don't get pay enough for this. But seriously, can someone tell me what's level 4? Anyways, one day user calls. One of the newer tech answers. A few minutes into the call, she gets frustrated and asks if I can intervene. I take the call and ask what the problem is. The caller explains she got a picture that she's trying to print full page, but it's not taking up the full page. I remotely connect to the PC, have her show me the picture she wants to print. I open Word, blow it up full page and send it to print. Caller then asks if she has to edit it every time to print full page and that she used to just open the picture, was able to select different sizes like wallet or full page and it would do it automatically, but the application didn't do it anymore. So I double click pick and Windows Photo app opens. Options are there to select different sizes. I try wallet, works fine. I select full page image, doesn't expand to full page. I check image properties, resolution something like 267 by 577. I explained to her, because resolution is so small, when she selects full page, it would only blow up to the max size of the actual pick resolution. Caller, not understanding, starts ranting she was able to do it before. I again explain it to her. I even went on Google, downloaded a high res image, something like 3000 by 2000, and demonstrated it to her that it does do full page for high resolution images, but not for low resolution and she'll have to edit it and blow up low resolution images. She again argues she was able to do it and starts putting the blame on us. After we did whatever to their system, it doesn't work anymore. Confused for a moment about what she's talking about, 
I then remembered that her company had Windows 7 PC, which, which were recently replaced with Windows 10. So I explained to her her computers were replaced, and she's using Windows 10 now. And in Windows 7, the photo app may have done that and blown it full page, also making it pixelated. But now Windows 10 only blows image up to the max resolution when full page is selected. She then insists she wants to go back to Windows 7. I told her no, she can't. Then she repeats her question why picture doesn't show full page. I again explained the resolution issue and demonstrated again with another high resolution I again downloaded and that it works, but for low resolution she'll have to manually blow it up to fit full page. She continues to go on about this is the way she's been doing it before and doesn't see why she has to manually edit anything and blamed us for changing the system. I put the phone on mute and start banging it on the desk. At this point the new tech is laughing at me. I then unmute and start speaking in a loud no BS tone to the caller. I asked her to show me where she got the image from. She pulls up an email with several picture attachments, all with low resolution downloaded from the internet. Simpler told her all will have the same issue and that whenever she's downloading pics from the internet in the future, download high resolution image and the way Windows 10 photo app handles the pic is by design and that there's nothing else I can do for her and to have a nice day. The moment she said okay, I ended the call. Yeah, I understand what she's saying. I mean, there have been things, and I can't remember specifically, but I do remember when switching from XP to Vista to whatever, 7, 8. Anytime you change operating systems, some of the native things that used to be able to work don't work the same anymore. Sometimes they're an improvement. Sometimes they're not so much of an improvement. Um, usually there's a way to revert back somewhere along the line, but I don't know. I think some of it depends on the uh, office suite that you're using. You know, back way back in the day, you had WordPerfect, you had office and now we have google docs so every one of them handles things slightly differently but there's usually a way to go in and manually monkey with stuff and make some things work but what are you gonna do you're fired denise i work for an msp and had a trouble ticket on monday afternoon client states internet and phones are down they haven't worked since friday their company it guy is out on pto apparently his daughter gave birth okay i drive out to their location and get to work corporate it is prepared he left them with a binder of documentation and passwords. I have every password and diagram I could ever need. I hope they lock that up when not in use. I get shown the network closet. I find a tiny sonic wall. I dislike sonic walls. I notice it's got a note on it. If internet stops working, unplug power cable and plug back in. <laughs> Apparently this happens often. What could it hurt? I power cycle the sonic wall. No change. There's no place to work in the closet, so I find an empty desk and connect my laptop to the network. I try to get to the sonic wall GUI. No dice. I hope this firewall isn't dead. I find out what the WAN address is and set up my laptop with it and head to the closet. I plug the cable that was in the WAN port into my laptop. Still nothing. That's odd. I double check the cables. The cable that was on the WAN side is going to a switch and the LAN side is going to the ISP equipment. Dang it. Switch into the proper port and check the Wi-Fi. Internet access. You've got mail. Double check with the users on site. Phones and internet are back up. Owner overhears me talking to the front desk about what happened. Asked for clarification. He said that he knows exactly who is to blame. It was Denise. The internet went down Friday. Denise went in to try and fix it. She ignored the note and instead swapped the ethernet cables. She then proceeded to come out of the closet and ask which cable she was supposed to unplug. <laughs> they tell her and she says, okay, we're good and leaves for the day. Best part of that Monday? She called out because she got wasted over the weekend and didn't feel well. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, Denise is fired. She's done. Wow. Just go in and start swapping cables. Don't even pay attention to the sign. In fact, sign or not, this lady had no business being in that closet. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Sorry I got my schedule a little screwed up this week. I uh, lost my mind Monday night and released today's video, Wednesday, yesterday, Tuesday morning, for whatever reason. I have no idea why. Uh, normally it would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday for sure for uh, Tales from Tech Support, but uh, I got no excuse, just mush. Also, I posted a picture yesterday of a little project I was working on with a uh, remote system monitor. Um, let me know if you guys are, do you think that's something that would go good on this channel? Are you interested in me doing my little redneck, you know, tech tips or no? Let me know down below, a little informal poll here, but you know, I'm, I'm a gadget guy, I'm a tinkerer, I'm a little unconventional with some stuff as you, might have guessed. But anyway. All right, let's read some stories. Your IT, fix a sparking fuse box. 
Just had a call from one of our oldest clients, around 11 machines and one server all running on site. He was panicking on the phone. Him. We just had a power cut so everything's offline and the box is sparking. Me, can you explain further? What box are you talking about? Him. The electrical box you installed and it's sparking. Is there anything you can do? This was installed by someone who worked for this company before I came on board. Me. I can recommend you call the fire brigade and your electricity supplier. There is nothing I can do. Him. But your IT, it's computers. You can fix it. Me. If it's sparking, it's a fire risk. I need you to phone the fire brigade now. It's not IT. He hangs up angrily and shortly after I get a call from my boss, who is elsewhere today, saying, Just had a complaint that you wouldn't fix a sparking fuse box. Is this correct? I explain the above call and he goes, Good. It's not our problem if it's caught fire, and they're 300 miles away. The fire brigade will get there quicker than we can. I don't know what actually happened in the end, but I can now see all their machines and their servers back online, so job done. Back to checking if machines are fully patched. What on earth would make this guy think that, you know, calling IT is the thing to do? First of all, if there's actual sparks, I doubt IT installed that box. If it's any kind of actual electricity, whether it's a junction box, a circuit breaker, that was probably installed by the electricians. Then the IT guy probably pulled his power from that. But yeah, IT doesn't usually do that. And down below, we've got a comment from Squish Pitcher that sums up my feelings completely. Nothing has chilled me more in adulthood than realizing how many seemingly normal adults are two steps away from becoming an effing Darwin Award. <laughs> You're an IT, but can you install this program? Leads to an unexpected twist. Apologies if details are missing. It's been a long time, so some of this has been lost to father time. So this was probably in the mid-2000s. I was fresh out of school where I got my degree in computering. The job was basic data entry. Anything a monkey would be able to do. Take this piece of paper with data on it, put it into the computer, and click save. Repeat dozens of times per day. The company was a contracting company that was hired by some government agency. One that is so OCD about its property you can't even throw trash in the trash can without approval, even if that property is a roll of packing tape with no tape left on it. I also needed to get federal security clearance to be employed there, to show I wasn't a terrorist or a threat to national security, and they even checked my credit score too, for some reason, even though I had no authority over money at the job. There were only about five people at the local office, and they all knew I know how to do computer stuff, so some come to me for help. One day my boss asked me to install a program on the PCs, I don't remember what the program was, but when he told me what it was, it seemed like a reasonable request to install it. I had to go to each PC and install it myself. We only had five PCs, so no big deal. I didn't think it would allow me to install it as I already knew I didn't have rights to install software on the PC. I try anyway, and as expected, I get denied. I asked my boss if he can give me the password to the local admin account. He doesn't know it, so he reaches out to the actual IT department. Request denied. So I go poking around to see if there's any loopholes I can use to get access. Manually copy the files to the relevant locations on the C drive and manually add the relevant registry keys. I check the NTFS permissions of the C drive and they would allow me to take ownership of the entire C drive and grant myself, or everyone in the group, full control if needed. I do have access to regedit as well, and again the permissions on the keys would allow me to take ownership and grant full control, but this method would be way too tedious so I followed in my mind as a last resort. As I had nothing else to do that day, it was a slow day, I was also tinkering around with other aspects of the PC, seeing what I could find. Did they still have Solitaire installed? Turns out they did, along with all the other games that came with Windows. Free Cell, Minesweeper, Spider Solitaire, I think they had that pinball game too. But after finishing poking around Windows Explorer, I moved on to the command prompt. They didn't disable it, so I poke around a bit and get to GP result. Policy name, set local admin password. File to use, network share, files, password.vbs. Please tell me they at least have some access control in place. Everyone forward slash full control. So the only thing stopping anyone from logging in his local admin account was knowledge of that network share path and knowing how to open VBS files in Notepad. And nothing at all stopping me from editing the file and changing the local admin password. For who knows how many PCs. I face palm as hard as I could that they would be so stupid. I try to install the software my boss asked me to and the password works. I go back to that network share and poke around the folder structure. There's another folder called archive. And in there is an archive of all the prior passwords too. <laughs> they 
They had enough smarts to change the passwords frequently, yet put the password in plain text in a publicly accessible network share that anyone can access. And the passwords weren't even that complex either, probably just as complex as having password123 as the password. And as if that wasn't bad enough, a year or two later, apparently, some people were caught browsing the internet while on the job, and they wanted to put a stop to that. We only had five PCs, so IT decided they would just remote into the PC and uninstall Internet Explorer. I'm sitting there in front of my PC watching their remote desktop session, and all they do is go to Control Panel, Add Remove Windows Features, Uncheck Internet Explorer. It even says right there on the description that it will only remove the Start menu and desktop icons, but I guess reading is hard. Yeah, they thought it would completely uninstall a core part of the OS. So needless to say, it didn't change a thing since we still had basically full control over the PCs, short of installing software. Plus, they still haven't fixed the issue with the admin passwords, so we could just log right back in as admin and undo any changes they wanted to make. The issue with the passwords was eventually fixed years later, right as I was getting laid off from that job because the government agency decided not to renew the contracting company's services. Really makes me wonder if there was any truly sensitive or possibly even classified data publicly available with zero access control in place, short of simply keeping the file path a secret. Well, I don't know about in actual government offices and their infrastructure, if they're any better, but I can tell you in a lot of contractors' offices, their security sucks. They make all these grandiose rules that, you know, you're almost too nervous to even apply for a job there because, you know, you got to go through so many background checks and they lay out 8 million little stupid rules about, you know, surfing online and this and that. And uh, yet, like you said, when you get in there, there's no security on these PCs at all. And as far as your, uh, I noticed you were talking about with your background checks, they did a credit check. Part of that is because uh, people working on different projects or documents, things like that, they want to make sure you're not somebody who can be compromised very easily, whether it's blackmail or whatever. Plus, it shows a lot about your character. If you're going to work there, are you an honest guy? Are you going to, you know, muck around and waste their money or whatever? So, but yeah, that's funny. Their whole IT department figured they could just delete the icons and it would go away. They're more expensive because they're better at containing the magic smoke. Many years ago, I worked for an MSP that primarily served small businesses and nonprofits. Accordingly, many of our clients were very cost conscious. Not in the typical IT is a cost center way, but more in that they were working with very tight budgets. I had a client ask for a quote for some spare Dell laptop power adapters, pretty standard. Identified the correct adapter for their laptop models from the official Dell web store and have my procurement team create and send a quote to the client. I get an email back from the client. Can you explain why the power adapters you quoted are nearly twice the price as the one I found here? Insert link to Newegg. I take a look at the new egg link and respond. Well, the product you identified only has one star rating, and one of the reviews says that the adapter overheated and started a fire. I would not recommend using this product, but if you're willing to take that risk and want to order it yourself, that's up to you. Response back from the client. I have approved the quote. Please let me know when the order ships. Thank you. The guy shopped on price only. He didn't read any reviews. I mean, I think that's how Amazon got so big. People just see a product and a price. They don't even know if the price is better than any other website sometimes, but you know, they see that free two day shipping and things like that and just assume that it's the better deal. If their equipment was under any kind of warranty and they got off brand aftermarket uh, power adapters, that warranty is no longer valid if something happens while that unit's plugged in to that power brick. Let's just adjust the temperature. Back at the start of my IT career, I was a student systems operator on a, at the time, 15 plus year old HP 3000 Series 3 at a college. As background, that system was a really old 16-bit, you read that right, mini computer that had a boot sequence that involved a set of 16 toggle switches and a step button. Woof. Three or four 30 megabyte hard disk packs that were about the size of dishwashing machines and was proudly on display in a glass encased room that was carefully climate controlled cold. One evening I was printing reports and doing some other work when I noticed that the temperature seemed a little warmer than normal. There was a circular recorder in the room, I'll provide a link to an example in the comments, that kept track of temperature and humidity for a week at a time. I took a look at it and saw that we were definitely trending warmer than normal. I wasn't the system manager or main operator, but knew enough to know that that wasn't desirable. 
I called the main system operator and was talking to him about what was happening and how to call out the HVAC guys after hours. While I was on the phone, in walks one of the campus security guards. Guard. Hey, it seems warmer than normal in here. Me. Yep, I'm on the phone to see about getting someone out to look at the AC since we're getting too hot in here. On the wall was a thermostat that was locked up in a plexiglass box with slits in it for airflow. Guard. Huh, I think I have a key for the thermostat box. Me. Hey, I'm about to call out support, so let's just let them work on it, okay? Guard. Well, I'm already here and have a key, so... Sure enough, he had a key that opened the box. He then reached up to the controls. Me. Hang on a sec. Don't touch. It was too late. He adjusted the temperature. What he and I didn't know is that wasn't a normal thermostat. It had an upper and lower range on it. When he adjusted it, it made the too warm air move into a range on the thermostat that was too hot for the system. It stopped immediately. Hard power down. I'm still on the phone with the main operator and I let him know what happened. I can't repeat the conversation here, but suffice it to say that there were multiple four-letter words involved. There was a small crowd lined up outside the glass wall looking in to see what was happening by the time the AC guy showed up. After he addressed whatever the AC issue was, I really don't remember now, sorry, I got to start up the system, which still ranks as the strangest boot process I've ever experienced. The toggle switches were numbered 0 through 15. I remember that there were several sets of on, off, 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 on, 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 off, on, off, 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 on, 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 off step. After the third or fourth step, one of the disc packs spun up and the system booted, thankfully. I now understand that I acted as a human bootstrap, which is included in your PC BIOS today. I don't think the security guard lost his job, but I know that he got in some really hot water. The rest of the time I worked there, I never saw anyone unlock the plexiglass case around the thermostat. Well, let me tell you something about those little uh, plexiglass cases with the slots in them. I don't care what kind of thermostat it is, if it's got those slots, I can change the temperature. Which means somebody else in that office figured out that they could change the temperature. Now that HVAC unit might have had some issues, but at the same time, it's not totally out of the realm of possibility that somebody with a butter knife reached up in there and adjusted that temperature just enough to take the edge off without drawing too much attention. The server is underwater. So I used to work for an MSP that specialized in school tech support, and I worked on the help desk. I answer the phone as usual, and the following conversation takes place. IT is me, you is customer. IT. Hello, this is blank. How can I help? User. We have no internet and the server's underwater. Uh, sorry, sir. Could you repeat that? The line isn't great. User. The server is underwater. IT. Ah, uh, okay. So the server's suffering from water damage? What exactly happened? How extensive is the damage? User. The area flooded and so has the school. The server is partially submerged. Can you help at all? IT. Right. Okay. There's not much I can do from my end, I'm afraid. I'll raise this to the area manager and they'll be in contact to arrange a visit. The server is powered off, correct? User. No, it's still running and has power. Okay, sir, I suggest if possible you shut the power to it off if you can do so safely. Not much to add, but it's one of the calls I had that caught me so off guard. <laughs> Server's underwater and it's still powered on. Once everything flooded, somebody should have been finding the main disconnect or something and shutting the power off to like everything. Like, shut that whole place down. Amazing. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I think I'm finally back on schedule now. Friday, video. Yep, we're good. So today we got Dime hanging out with us. He's uh, he's ready for his after-dinner nap, and uh, we're ready for some stories. Help. New TV can't find Fox News. I perform primarily PC repair, troubleshooting, and maintenance for residential and business clients. Most of my appointments are booked by someone else, so I'm used to going in blind. Me. What can I help you with today? Resident. I can't seem to get the cable box to work on my kitchen TV. It worked on the other day, but I don't like the fire TV. Me. I immediately notice the cable box is off. I turn it on with the front button that is not identified unless you've already pushed it. Thanks, Verizon. This is a fire TV. Do you have an Amazon account? Resident. Spends 20 minutes looking for the password. Me. I use the waiting time to have a conversation with the husband. In the future, you can avoid paying for an appointment with me by calling Verizon Tech Support since you pay them for service instead of watching me call them. Resident. You don't work for Verizon? Me. Nope. Points to the logo on my shirt. So you work for the local Verizon competitor? No, I'm pretty service agnostic. 
After getting the password, I do a channel scan. Realize it's plugged in via HDMI, so I need to switch the inputs. Resident. Want some coffee? Cream, no sugar, thanks. Me. Do you have a remote from Verizon? Resident. Oh yeah, right here. The remote doesn't work. Oh, it's a backwards AAA. Good news, I don't have to call the Verizon tech. It was bad batteries, and I demonstrate switching inputs. Wife looks at husband. Do we still have the old TV? Yeah, there's been a few times in my life I felt that way too. I get into something and I have no idea what I'm doing, but I try. Then realize I'd kind of rather have the old, whatever, you name it, TV. Used to be computers, but anymore, I kind of got better with that. Cars, for sure. I just think it's funny that the people wouldn't investigate for themselves to look for a power button, check the batteries in the remote, things like that. I don't know. Please don't do that. So we had some onboardings yesterday. Girl came in, maybe mid-twenties. I handed her her new notebook, explained the ticket system, and welcomed her. We just had to change her password from the default one. She asks me, Could you hand me a piece of paper so I can write down my password? I stand there for a moment, trying to comprehend that. Then I snap out of it. Me. Well, please don't do that. Her. But I'll forget it otherwise. Me. You can have it reset in that case. Her. No, it's okay. I can remember it. And that was it. Or so I thought. Within the hour, I got a ticket to reset the password. Turns out she couldn't actually remember. I can sort of understand where the lady's coming from. I mean, I don't write them down, but like I have a password app in my phone that helps me keep them straight most of them I can remember in my head but uh you know as you get older sometimes the memories tend to blend together while others disappear but there should have been some kind of way for her to you know be able to get it set up and have a cheat sheet or some kind of app or something to help her along until she could remember it but of course I don't know if she was making the password or if you guys are making the password and giving it to her if you guys are making it then you definitely got to give her a hand man I don't know what do you guys think Ghost Hacker? This one's an email submission from Mongo Only Pawn. When I first started at my current job, a ticket was put in from one of the known Luddites, a very sweet older lady who maybe should have backed away from computers. Her ticket stated that she was afraid she'd been hacked. Being in IT, we're familiar with certain people who think every computer issue is because they've been hacked, which is why I didn't immediately commandeer the computer, pull the power plug and remove it from her desk and from our network. I get to her desk and she tells me she's afraid her network login has been hacked. I walk her through changing her password and I scan her computer for malicious files. Before I go to the next steps, I think I should ask her a few questions about why she thinks she may have been hacked. She said it's because her Facebook looks like it has been hacked. I said okay, and I thought, hmm, she must have accessed Facebook on her work computer. And while it was being controlled, the person might have gotten access to her work computer. I asked her if she changed her password on Facebook and she did that while I was there. I said, what makes you think your work computer was hacked? I don't see anything that would lead me to believe that. Your mouse doesn't move on its own, file sharing's turned off, and we haven't seen any breaches through our firewall or network monitoring of non-sanctioned logins. Her reply was the stuff of IT nightmares. Oh, I use the same password for everything. I use my Facebook password for my work login and for my banks and Amazon and everything else I do online. <laughs> oh my god. I almost facepalmed right there at her desk. Well, that's not a good idea. I gotta say, I am a creature of habit and... I do get bad about certain things being the same password, or sometimes just a varied pattern of a certain password, but I definitely try to break out things between Facebook and banking, or anything that's got my credit card information, anything to do with money, personal information. I try to keep them split off so that, yeah, just in case. Like I mentioned before, there's a good app for that. Works better when plugged in. Happened a couple months ago, Went to a client site to fix issue with wireless network and realized that the printer in one of the departments was unplugged from the network. I fixed it. One of the staff members, who I shall call Jane, thanked me, saying it was down for a while and now she can finally print. A few weeks later, I get an email from Jane saying the department can't print anymore. I checked the printer, realized there was an IP conflict, and fixed her issue. A few days later, Jane's department manager, who I shall call Karen, sends an email saying that staff can't print and the printer is always having issues and they want a new printer. I respond letting her know the previous issue was that the network cable was unplugged and the second time was an IP conflict and nothing's wrong with the printer, but I'll look into it. Contacted the staff to see what the issue was. Printer wasn't installed on the laptop. Installed. 
now they can print. One month later, Jane emails that they can't print because it's low on toner. My company sent the toner to them. One month later, Jane sends an email again that they can't print. Then Karen emails saying, this is always happening with that printer. It's not working and demands it be replaced with a new one and says, and how my company is only patching a broken printer that needs to be replaced. I again explain that nothing is wrong with the printer and again point out why they couldn't print with the past issues. I again look into it. Apparently the printer's out of ink and no one installed the new toner that we sent them a month ago. I had one of their staff do it and the printer was operational again. A few weeks pass by and Jane sends emails to Karen telling her they can't print. Karen sends emails demanding the printer be replaced and that it constantly is breaking down. I pulled out my previous email chain with the past issue and resolution. Forwarded that letter to her knowing nothing is wrong with the printer. I called to speak with Jane but was informed no one was in at the moment in that department. I decided I'll try back later. Another manager at Karen Company who I shall call Karina emailed my boss agreeing with Karen demanding the printer be replaced and that this was an ongoing issue. I replied to the email letting Karina and my boss know that I tried reaching Jane or anyone in the department but no one was available. I also included my previous email chain showing nothing was ever wrong with the printer. At some point during the day, my company sent a copier tech to check the printer. Tech sent his update to one of our sales reps, who then emailed Karen and Karina letting them know the problem was fixed, but forgot to remove the attachment pic of copier tech ticket. I read the notes in the pic and I quote, Nothing is wrong with the printer. It works fine, but works even better when plugged into the power outlet. So people are unplugging wires probably shifting things around, ignoring the toner levels, and just basically expecting it to always work no matter what. Or playing the it's not my job game, whatever. And then blaming this company because they're having printer issues. Amazing. No, Karen, you have to go to cybersecurity for a password reset. Yes, I'm sure. No, you're not going to get me fired, Karen. So at Stupid Industries LLC, we have an IT department and a cybersecurity department. These two departments both have admin access to the entire system and network, but cybersecurity falls under the security department, and whereas we handle IT issues not related to security. One of the many things that cybersecurity handles is password recovery and password resets. Namely, if you forget your password, you have to march yourself down to cybersecurity's office and face them in person to get your password reset. The upside to this is that any issue related to passwords isn't my problem. Yesterday, I'm in the back cave, supervising the IT interns and running the help desk. I get a phone call. IT department, how can we help you? This is Karen, assistant VP of the bean counting department. Well, how can we help you, Karen, I ask. Your stupid system isn't taking my password. Okay, Karen, can you have an office neighbor take five seconds and try to log themselves into your computer to see if there's a problem with the computer? I patiently wait for the Banshee to strong arm someone into doing it. He got logged in just fine. It's just me. Well, Karen, I think you're going to have to walk down to cybersecurity to get your password reset, I explain. But I already called you. Why can't you do it for me? She shrieks. I swear I can hear her across the building. I'm sorry, Karen. Cybersecurity handles password recovery. Don't forget to take your company ID when you walk down to cybersecurity. At Moron Corp, the IT department handled password recovery over the phone. Why can't you do it? Well, Karen, here at Stupid Industries, only cybersecurity can recover passwords. But they said they would write me up if I came in another time to get a new password. Can you please do it for me? Well, Karen, I don't know what to say, but you're just going to have to go down to cybersecurity. I'll have your job for this, you pimple-faced nerd. <laughs> she proceeded to use some naughty words before hanging up on me. I wrote it up as a ticket in the ticket system and closed the ticket out, making notes of the time she called in and her abusive language. That afternoon, my boss calls me into his office. Got a call from HR. You have a complaint, Danakius. Am I saying that right? Karen in the bean counting department, I ask? Why, yes. Care to explain yourself? Troubleshot or issue. Referred her to cybersecurity for a password reset. Wrote up the ticket, number 22022439. I say, reading it off the notepad in my pocket. Uh-huh, he mutters. He looks it up on the computer. Okay, let's listen to the call log. Seven to eight minutes later, we're having a laugh about it, and he emails the head of the bean counting department, the call log from the IT line. We also had a call into HR about her abusive language over the phone. Moral of the story, call logs are your friend. So another one with bad memory and password issues. Awesome. And on top of that, she's a VP who has no idea how company policy works. That's awesome. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. 
So today, me, my son-in-law, and one of his friends decided to make the long trek over to Micro Center over in Rockville, Maryland. And where I'm from, that is a two and a half to three hour drive depending on traffic. It's a cool place. It's sort of like, you know, Disneyland for techs. All kinds of stuff. You can't even imagine, unless you've been to one, uh, the amount of parts, peripherals, computers, mice, keyboards, uh, cables, soldering equipment, Raspberry Pi stuff from beginner to advanced, you know. And I was the big spender of the day. We drove two and a half to three hours and I got this, an APC. Nice, huh? Although I will say, this will be nice for organizing my stuff under the desk because the uh, cords don't fight each other as bad. There is actual good surge protection and uh, yeah, decent USB charging. So, eh. All right, let's read some stories. Excuse me, I can't help you with that. So this happened a few minutes ago. I'm a tech support agent at a very large global company. We do all kinds of stuff. My department mainly handles general first line support for customers. I get the occasional weird call. Sometimes customers have a weird problem and sometimes the customer is the problem. To me, these are the highlights of my days, but I digress. Today I got a call that started normal with a normal issue, but quickly went sideways, like so. Me. All right, so your issue's been resolved. Is there anything else I could help you with? Customer. Sure, I still have some questions. My pharmacy stopped prescribing this weight loss drug. <laughs> my pharmacy stopped prescribing this weight loss drug and my doctor won't prescribe it to me. Can you do this or make them? Me. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Not sure I follow. Customer. My doctor won't prescribe this medication. Can you? Me. Uh, I'm sorry, but we're company A. I can't assist you with pharmacy stuff and medication. Customer. Huh. I thought you guys were a big company. Is company A. No matter. Me. Anything else from our products or services that I could help you with? Customer. Actually, yes. I have a huge bank account with money from all over. Can you help me make a few transactions and help me with some connections towards this company? Me. At this point, completely given up. Miss, this is company A. Please, please contact the right support or people for your issue. A few back and forths later, I finally get through to her that I am from company A, not her doctor, not her banking support. Customer. So about that prescription, can you at least get me that? <laughs> me. Uh, thank you for calling. If you have any further questions, please give us another ring. Have a splendid Sunday. Customers can really do a number on you. Wouldn't it be nice if there was like one global customer support line that you could call? You know, hey, I can't get my prescription. Yeah, I need legal advice. I can't figure out why my car is making this funny noise. And then maybe, you know, as a bonus, you could get some actual tech support taken care of. Hello, you've reached tech support. How? Oh, no. I work in a tech support department in a big call center for a phone slash internet slash TV company. I get a call last week. Seems fairly normal. Customer's pretty upset because our crappy ass sales department, don't get me started on them, messed up the order and it got canceled and customer was supposed to get the modem today. He sounds like he's 40 plus years old. He starts up with asking for a manager. I try to calm him down and I get to that order and then he starts. My wife of 20 years old was cheating on me. She left me and threw away all my stuff, told me to move out. She took everything away from me. Everything, the kids too. Kids are visiting me today and they need the Wi-Fi for homework. And listen, at this point I did feel bad. I would feel even worse if he also wasn't cursing me out and I forgot to mention he was really, really, really drunk. I have a feeling not having the modem today for the kids is not as bad as being dead drunk on that day. Anyway, I feel really bad about all this so I get to sending the modem out again. I go into ordering. I try to resend equipment. During all this, my customers seemed to mellow down. Got a little quiet. But I heard some scary gurgling noises here and there. I ignored it. I finish the order. The gurgling and what seems like snoring get really loud. I tell the customer we're finished and that unfortunately we can't get the modem there today. No response. I'm pretty scared at this point. I don't really want him to respond. Drunk people freak me out so much, even on the phone, for reasons I won't disclose. But I have to do my job so I try to, hello sir, hello, are you there? For a couple minutes with intervals of me just being silent and texting my team leader to ask him what to do. I finally give up. This man is 100% asleep. I hang up. I did finish the order for him, even though I shouldn't do it without his verbal approval, but I knew he does need the modem in the end and at least he'll get a text message confirming the order. There's no added cost for resending it. Farewell, drunk sad man. Hope your kids won't have to stay at your place while you're in this state of being. Yeah, it is kind of sad when people feel that hopeless that they need to get so drunk that, uh, 
you know, they feel like they need to do that just to cope. I hope his kids were all right and were able to go back home so this guy can work out whatever issues he's got. Uh, I understand being distraught that your wife cheated on you, but uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. On the other hand, having drunk customers call up is just uh, something I don't wish on anybody. When I was a teenager, I worked in a pizza place. We had this guy that would call up about once a week, every Friday or Saturday, give or take, and just plaster it out of his mind and try to order Chinese food. And no matter how much I tried to tell him that we didn't make Chinese food, we made pizza, he just wanted to argue. He would keep me on the phone for top five, 10 minutes, sometimes 15. Even if I hung up, he'd call right back. It's amazing how he knew the number and still thought it was Chinese food. Keeping your head below the parapet. A survival tip from the old retired tech support guy. This is only my second post on here, but following that, I had a few requests for more stories. It seemed from my last post that a lot of you work in fairly high pressure environments. For myself, I was on IT support for a large London trading bank. Moving on later to become the IT manager of said bank, answerable only to the IT director who shall remain nameless. During my nine plus years at this bank, it was a woman IT director for around the first six years until she was replaced. Now this lady, it must be said, was feared by all the IT staff, myself included. When she was not happy about something, the whole floor could hear her. Her shouts from behind her closed office door made most people freeze with an uh-oh, who's getting a new one torn now expression. It must be said that I only experienced her wrath on maybe four or five occasions during my six year acquaintance with her. And she did, after all, give me the job at the bank in the first place, so I'll not speak too badly of her. This lady was a highly intelligent woman who spoke three languages fluently, Italian, French, and English. The bank I worked for was not an English bank, though being based in London, everyone spoke English. The first time I got called to her office was because an important overnight report never got printed because of a glitch in one of the servers. I stood in her office and stood looking at her in amazement as she looked me in the eye and shouted something like, what the bloody hell, French, French, expect to Italian, Italian, French, right now, and don't you Italian, French, Italian, Swahili? Report. Well, you get the picture. She couldn't stick to one language when she lost the plot. And any one of the IT staff she happened to be having a go at could only pray that they said the right thing at the end of it. So what have you got to say? Phew, I understood that bit. You then hoped your next reply would fit. Sorry, it won't happen again. Or, sorry, I'll look into it right away. Usually sufficed. And you then left and tried to figure out what she was going on about by gleaning information from others. I quickly found that by adopting an old tactic I had learned from my previous jobs, I avoided being stopped and called into her office. Basically, get yourself a clipboard and have some papers on it. If you leave your office to go from A to B for any reason, grab that clipboard. Always walk with purpose, glancing at it occasionally. Most people's IT problems are fairly minor, seeing you purposefully striding past, clipboard in hand. A lot of users will think, hmm, maybe I can check the power lead myself, etc. Even if it's a pretty serious problem, it'll give you a few seconds breathing space because although they may stop you to quickly tell you the problem, they won't expect you to fix it there and then because, hey, you obviously have bigger fish to fry. I don't see any of this as being a cop out, but it was a coping strategy for me. It allowed me to decide if I wanted to say, sure, let's take a look, or glancing worriedly at my clipboard and saying, sorry, I'm on my way to a meeting. This latter one more so when I became IT manager. I even used it when called into the director's office. I only had to quickly glance at the clipboard while she ran it in tongues for her to say, do you have a problem? I could then reply with something along the lines of, one of the servers is showing an imminent hard drive failure. Well, what the hell are you doing standing there talking to me for then? Go and sort it. Okay, so some of you may look at me in a bad light, but remember, IT support people get a lot of unnecessary crap and very little thanks. Everyone thinks their issue should be sorted first. If this takes the heat off or gives you a little breathing space rather than to have a nervous breakdown, then why not? It also helped me remain calm when everyone else was running around like headless chickens. Especially if you have an IT director running out of her office shouting, Servers down! Servers down! I used to calmly ask myself what the issue really was. Was a server down or had a power breaker tripped on a row of traders' desks? If it was a server, which one? Which floor? Think about causes, effects, solutions, then apply said. Getting caught up in other people's madness does not help you or others. I dare say some at the time would look at me and think, he acts like he doesn't care. I did care, I just didn't panic. Never underestimate the power of an important looking clipboard. It reminds me of the Jason Bourne movies. Grab up a, you know, something to help your disguise. A clipboard, a pair of glasses, a uniform looking hat, something, and walk like you have purpose, like you're supposed to be there doing what you're doing right then and there. 
Most of the time, people would leave him alone and act like he was supposed to be there to begin with. I'm not sure I've ever tried it, but it might be worth a shot. I wonder if that would work here at the house. I'll have to find a clipboard. I'll get back to you on that. Owner of company needs a talking to. I'm pretty new to this Reddit, but I feel at home. So I've been in IT since the mid 90s, mainly support and management of support. This happened in the late 90s. I was working for an IT recruiter, one of the biggest at the time. We had just fitted a firewall for the first time, shows how long ago, that logged all users browsing. I was called into my manager's office thinking the worst, but was happily told that I needed to have a word with the owner of the company. The reason I had to have a word was because A, the senior IT staff couldn't stop laughing, B, they thought it was funny to send me, and C, I had been there only a few months. So it was I that had to go and tell someone that was, at the time, 100% richest people list, that he had to stop browsing his very special interest sites during the day on his work computer as IT was flagged every time he visited one. He took it on the chin, laughed and asked if I'd got the short straw, and let me on my way. <laughs> oh my god, he blew it off? I guess if you own the company, who cares? You know, what are you gonna do? You gonna fire me? still strange at that time that he wouldn't think that anybody would find out, but whatever. DR room plus whole building hot water leak equals bad. So I worked in a local government in the UK and where I worked we had two main buildings. Building 2 had a nuclear bunker under it which also had some other rooms all around it. Oh, and the whole building's heating slash hot water system. Some of these extra rooms were doing nothing so it got chosen as a DR for the IT stuff that was all in building 1. 100,000 pounds is roughly the cost to get it done, including the fiber links, etc. Anyway, one day I got in to be told the heating system had ruptured, and please could we all run down there as it was flooding. So me and six colleagues using nothing but brooms had to stand in a few centimeters of close to boiling water and sweep said water away from the server room for an hour or two. I think we managed to keep all the kits safe, though, and they did buy us all new shoes as ours were boiled to death. Who exactly did the risk management? That's what I want to know. 100,000 of kit next to an aging hot water system? Really? Fun fact about the nuclear bunker. If a nuke hit the nearest very big city, the idea is that someone starts filling the water reserve with fresh water for the people to have whilst in there. But we were told with authority that there was nowhere near enough time for that to be done before the shockwave and fallout hit. So basically, utterly pointless room that they kept stocked with food, just in case. Well, as much as I hate to say it, <laughs> It's not totally purposeless. Um, setting up rooms like this, if if something hits another city further away and it gives you time, great. You've got some possibility of a usable space with fresh water and provisions. But uh, if it does hit the next closest city to you, um, at least it keeps people busy and out of a panic. Because there's nothing worse than having people in a panic, honestly, um, no matter what the outcome is going to be having them run around injuring themselves and doing dumb things no matter what isn't going to end well even if things aren't going to end well if you know what i mean it sounds strange but it's true it's the same reason the government usually won't let you know if there's imminent danger in your city because the only thing that's going to happen is you're better off staying in place in most cases because the only thing that's going to happen is all the roads are going to get clogged hurt or injured uh go after each other it's just going to create more problems for the infrastructure in the end so yeah, it's, you know, I'm not against secrecy, but at the same time, I'm not for having people panic like that. It just doesn't do any good. Just like that other story. You know, it's not that I don't care, but why panic? It doesn't help anything, so. Well, I did it again. I just did an entire episode of Tales from Tech Support and went to stop the recording only to realize that it wasn't running. <laughs> so you hopefully get a more polished version now. Although my blood pressure is about up to here, I just stopped everything, went downstairs, ate like a half a gallon of ice cream, something, some kind of triple chocolate, whatever. I haven't had ice cream in quite a while. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. And now, the good news is, there was no cats on the first, what I thought was a recording, and now we got two of them. Yep, Nickel's the white and gray, Dime is the black one who is, I don't know what he's doing, just chilling. All right, let's read some stories. Fix the connection. The training's already started. This just happened to me and I thought it would be great here. A group at work had a meeting set up for some training with an outside vendor. The vendor's working from home. Lucky them. While the rest are in a training room in the office. The people being trained barely know how to log onto the systems. They had me come on site. Well, 
My desk is just across the street in another building and no work from home for me to help get them all signed into the systems. The video was a little pixelated and lagging when they started. Thought it was just a slow connection and didn't think anything of it. Got a call shortly after I left helping everyone get set up that the presenter was having issues controlling the slide deck which was on the presenter computer in the training room and demanded that I fix it. Advised that the building's internet wasn't the issue. 100 meters long, 5 story building with several hundred desks and only this one presenter is having issues? Yeah, not likely the network at the office. And had the presenter reboot his home router. Got an email back after about 15 minutes that they're all working. Don't know why people never think their home connection with the cheap cable modem, router, Wi-Fi combo boxes as being the cause and think it's the corporate systems with the dedicated hardware that's much more reliable. I don't know man, I've been in some corporate settings where the, really, the equipment wasn't any more reliable at all. It was just a matter of somebody's getting paid to keep an eye on it all the time. At home, I have no problem with my cable modem. It's, you know, it's a, sta it's a tried and true standard in-home cable modem. Um, we run gigabit internet service here. Our service is stable. We're in a location where we don't have to worry about a lot of bad weather issues and things like that. No matter what, you got to do some power cycles every so often. Just to keep things fresh and uh, don't assume it's everybody else's issue. Sometimes you got to work on your own stuff first. Oatmeal Lady. I'd like to make my contribution to the stuff that shouldn't be in your PC category of tales. I used to work in a PC repair shop in a small town. AKA the only PC repair shop within an hour's drive. One rainy day, my coworker was present and we were chatting, working on stuff, and just generally having a pleasant day. In walks this young woman with her PC in a trash bag, which didn't immediately set off alarm bells for me seeing as it was raining. I was closer to the front door, so I greeted her and asked what was wrong. She explained how it was a custom PC built by a friend a while ago, and that she was afraid to turn it on. Now I'm a bit worried, and ask her if she accidentally spilled fluid into it or if she saw the infamous magic smoke. She just shook her head, then proceeded to untie the trash bag. The smell was horrible. I can hear my coworker gag from the room next to our front office after a moment of silence. I just stare at the young woman who had brought this PC into our tiny, poorly ventilated shop, too stunned to speak. She explains, Yeah, I spilled oatmeal in it, a few days ago, so I left it outside in this bag. I was hoping it would harden and I could, like, chip it off. Now, it was summertime, of course. And where I live, it must have hovered around 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit that week. This oatmeal was made with milk and must have curdled in those temps. So when she opened this bag, all hell broke loose for your nostrils. Apparently, the PC sat next to her desk where she ate breakfast. She knocked her fresh bowl of oatmeal directly on top of the PC case. It dripped through the radiator, upper fans, down the motherboard, and onto the graphics card. One big, horrifying, goopy mess. Fortunately, the client immediately unplugged the PC, so it somehow wasn't damaged. Though cleaning it took my coworker and I hours as we kept having to walk away. <laughs> Nonetheless, after a whole thing of contact cleaner, a soft bristled toothbrush, patience, and some gagging, it was clean and turned on. Though I noticed corrosion on the inside of some of her graphics card's display ports. When I asked the client about it as I couldn't figure out what happened there, she said her toddler occasionally played with the display cables, putting them in her mouth then plugging them back in. That wouldn't cause any harm to it, right? I brushed her teeth. Fortunately, one HDMI port still worked on the graphics card, though explaining why organic substances, especially those of the liquid variety, were bad for computers to an adult was quite interesting. Even if those organic substances are your toddler's saliva, and yes, even if you keep up on said toddler's dental hygiene. Not as funny as some of the other tales I've read on here, but hopefully someone gets a kick out of my trauma from dealing with the general public. Okay, there's a lot going on here. First of all, if you're gonna eat or drink at your desk, and I do, I got I got an ice cream bowl sitting right here that needs to go down to the kitchen sink. I, I've got a soda bottle sitting over here. I'm not gonna not eat at my workstation. It's just the way it goes, okay? This is part of my life. But I'm also not going to put my PC down on the floor underneath of this surface where I keep food and drink. It's just dumb. As much as this thing gets on my nerves with the fans whirring next to my microphone, and my desk isn't tiny, but, you know, there's only so much space in this room. I'm going to keep it up here where it's nice and safe. And then letting your toddler play with the cables on your computer? Let alone letting her stick them in their mouth. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it can't be good for her teeth to start chewing on this stuff. Oh, by the way, and if she pulls the wrong cable with the wrong end and sticks it in her mouth and it's live, like what happens if she pulls the power cable out of the power supply? Sticks that in her mouth. That ought to end well. 
<sighs> French fried laptop slash docking station. The sad tale of Mr. Bunny Slippers. I was working late last night doing the Friday night help desk shift. Normally it's slow as molasses as 99% of people go home. We didn't have any Friday issues spilling over so I ordered a small pizza and broke out my tablet to watch TV. My computer dings. I got a tech support ticket from the head of the TPS department. Mr. Bunny Slippers. Laptop won't dock. I think I broke something. Now 99% of the time, I think I broke something equals I just broke something. And this specific ticket means I'm not even going to bother trying to remote in. I get to his office and there's a grown man in bunny slippers and PJs sitting at his computer and the entire room smells like fast food. Checkers specifically. And his laptop is next to the docking station. I flip it over and there's a french fry squished to the docking station. Sir, I think I can get this straightened out. I'll be right back with the right tools. I go back down to the back cave and get the contact cleaner, scrub brush, paper towels, etc. and come back. Five minutes of cleaning and I have Mr. Bunny Slipper's laptop into the docking station and behold, it powers up and his peripherals connect. I'm sorry, Mr. Bunny Slippers tells me. Well, at least you didn't try to wash it out in the sink yourself, I tell him. Yeah, I figured that I could just F it up worse like my marriage, he tells me. I look around the room and there's pillows and blankets on his couch. You okay, sir? I ask. Yeah, I had another question. Where's the computer's CD drive? I do a quick check and his laptop doesn't have an optical drive. Do you need one to access some data? Nah, I just brought these movies from home he replies, and reaches under his desk and pulls out a stack of DVDs. They're all retail discs, so I figure they should be safe. Sir, can you put in a ticket to request a USB DVD drive to review training materials for me? He goes to his desk and writes a note. A USB DVD drive to review training materials? He asks as he's scribbling. Close enough, sir, I tell him. I watch him start another ticket and I go down to the back cave. Ticket number two is in by the time I get there and I pull a USB Blu-ray DVD drive off the shelf and take it up to Mr. Bunny Slippers to get it set up for him. I also toss in a movie to check it for him. The audio sucks pretty bad on the laptop. Sir, can you put in one more request for better speakers and I can get you fixed up good? Oh yeah, I can do that. What do I put in, he asks. Better speakers to go with the DVD drive. Okay, he tells me. I go down and pull the best speakers we have for him and come back and get them set up. This should put you in good shape, I tell him. How long can I keep the drive and speakers, he asks. Well, I issued them to you, seeing as how the head of your department says you need them for reviewing training materials, I explain. Oh, well thank you, he tells me. I go back down to the back cave and count my lucky blessings that I'm not sleeping in my office in stupid industries. Well, that explains the bunny slippers and the fast food smells. I don't know how high up the chain this guy was, but it's usually frowned upon in most corporate environments uh, for employees to be sleeping in their offices. But good on you, OP, for not busting his chops and just, you know, getting him set up, keeping him happy, and, uh, you know, maybe give the guy a little bit of a break while he tries to figure out what to do next. Sausage Roll Keyboard I used to work for a local government in the UK and was third line support slash network engineer. But, you know, you get drawn into all sorts of support, not just the high end stuff. So I saw this ticket from some woman in the department downstairs saying her keyboard wasn't working right. I go down there and ask her what gives and I check the keyboard over and lo and behold, there's loads of food leftovers in there. And I quietly empty the detrius and mention to her that she should maybe push it out of the way at lunchtime. A few months later, I see a ticket for the same thing from the same woman. I go down there, walk in and just pick up her keyboard, turn it upside down and shake the contents onto her desk. You can make a whole sausage roll out of that, I exclaimed loudly, so everyone in their department could hear. I told her if she didn't stop eating over it, no more keyboard for her, and left with her red-faced. It was disgusting, literally pieces of sausage meat under her keycaps. I have so many worse, much, much worse stories than this from my time there. Working for local government sucks. Again, my equipment is all on my desk, and I do eat at my desk. And if I'm not lounging back in my chair eating, which is nowhere near my keyboard, if I am sitting up, I'll take my keyboard and move it back under the monitor. Problem solved. I also have a laptop that's been sitting in my shop for about seven years until I just did an upgrade on it and a cleaning last month. And uh, before that, I had never turned it upside down, took a brush, compressed air, nothing to it. Not even to the fan, nothing. Took it all apart, cleaned it up. In order to take this one apart, you have to take the keyboard mat off. And, you know, it's just the keyboard. So I turned it upside down, tapped it a little bit, brushed it, blew some air through it, tapped on it some more. And some crap fell out, but nothing like this guy described, and it's been sitting there for seven years. That means she's just nasty. 
If it's too large, then why is my computer able to access it? I recently received a phone call from a user experiencing low disk space. I ended up having to explain why storing 4K video on a low-end Chromebook does not make sense. Me, I understand that you want to have a local copy of the video available, but the file is too large and your computer is not capable of playing 4K video. I can convert the file to a lower resolution for your Chromebook. User, no, I don't want you to convert the file to a lower resolution. I want to be able to view the files as I always have. Me, did anything change recently? User, no, nothing changed. We have the event once a month and the videographer gives me the original file on a USB drive and I copy it to my computer. We almost didn't get a recording of the last four events because the last videographer quit and we had to find a new one last minute. Me, looking at the file size of the videos, I see what the problem is. Your new videographer is recording at 4K resolution. This produces extremely massive files. Your old videographer was recording at DVD resolution. User, yes, I want high resolution just like my DVDs. Me, this is not just like your DVDs. It's considered ultra high resolution and you don't own any equipment capable of playing that resolution. The files are too large for your computer. I would suggest keeping the original on a USB thumb drive and I can create a DVD resolution file for you to keep on your hard drive. User, if it's too large, then why is my computer able to access it? Me, your computer simply plays a resolution it's capable of playing. User, I have a meeting in five minutes, I'll have to call back, but I find this extremely unacceptable that suddenly my computer is now unable to play high resolution video when it worked perfectly all last year. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm gonna put this one all on you, OP. The minute you realize this guy had no idea that 4K and DVD quality videos, you know, created vastly different file sizes, that's when you should have stopped right there and said, listen, if I can give this to you in the same quality that you're used to watching, would you be happy with that? And as soon as he said yes, do the deed, be done with it, walk away. Some people you just cannot explain this stuff to. It's too abstract for them, they don't get it. And listen, I'm a hammer and nails guy, I'm a carpenter by trade, so some of this software stuff, like I'm looking at Raspberry Pi stuff just because I like gadgets. Some of the stuff they make with these things is very foreign and abstract to me. It's hard for me to get my head around it. So I can understand where somebody that knows nothing about computers at all would have no idea about the resolution differences in Chromebooks and all that. So, Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. No cats today, but I did remember to put the code hook up. I need a Surface Pro. At my last workplace, we issued HP EliteBook 840G6 as our mainstream laptops and Surface Pros, generally to execs and some of the staff that traveled a lot. We started to get users requesting Surface Pros, usually claiming that they had back issues and transporting a heavy laptop was causing them issues. My approach to that was to have them bring their laptop bag into me so that I could get them sorted out. They would front up expecting a new Surface. Instead, I'd make them remove everything from their laptop bag with the exception of the 840 and its charger. Then I'd make them compare it to a Surface Pro with accessories in the same type of bag, before telling them to F off. There was less than 200 grams difference, when you included the type cover, mouse and a couple of dongles and all that excessive weight was all the other crap that they were cramming into their laptop bags. Yep, somebody's always looking for an excuse to get upgrades on their equipment. Me? I would have just asked because I wanted this shiny new stuff. And as far as weight goes, if you can't carry one laptop bag with some other crap and some accessories and the laptop in it, somebody's always got to have something to whine and cry about, though. We need you to price out moving the server so we can turn the server room into a break room. So my boss showed me a memo this morning. We need you to price out moving the servers downstairs so we can turn the server room into an executive break room. I asked him if it was a joke and he told me no. Well, boss, why don't you just call the fire alarm company and price out installing a new fire suppression system and start there. Do we really need to go that far? Yeah, start with the outside contractors first. Besides, I'd bet any money those guys will charge three arms and a leg to take out the old system and add a new system downstairs. That's not one, but two major construction jobs. Yeah, we can't leave the server room a death trap, so we need to call the access control company as well, he replied. Oh, make sure to CC all the higher ups on the running tally, I suggested. That idiot that decided to move the break room is going to get sticker shock long before we're done. Yeah, why would you even think about trying to move all that equipment and everything just for an executive break room? Find a new place for your executive break room. Maybe they gotta walk a little, who cares? Maybe they don't even need a break room. Have them go take their breaks and eat their lunch with the rest of the unwashed. I dressed down the commanding general. I recently returned to the IT world and this story recently returned to my mind. 
We're having network issues here at work, so I decided to go ahead and jot this down. I know this is military heavy, but still concerning IT. This happened about 16 years ago when I was deployed to Eastern Europe with the Army. I was a member of the G6, basically military help desk. Despite my rank, E4 or specialist, I was one of the go-to people for tech problems. Cast. Me, at the time a lowly specialist E4, but part of the head tech team, lost hopelessly in the pursuit of getting my E5, sergeant rank. SGM, my sergeant major, E9, basically my big boss on the enlisted side of things. CG, commanding general, the boss of the entire mission. For you civilians out there, he was the equivalent of a CEO. CSM, command sergeant major, my SGM's boss. He would be like a COO. Now for some military context. We had two networks in the Nippernet, non-classified, and the Cipernet, classified. Then there was a top secret network. All these were regulated by AR-25-2. It's laid out very specific rules for all of these networks. Hope I said those things right. One of which was, you do not, under any circumstances, have the Nippernet and Cipernet on the same computer. There are even rules for laying out the cabling. Saying, like, you can't have NIPR and SIPR cables within a foot of each other. Now, as you can probably imagine, the majority of these people were up in age and really didn't know the ins and outs of technology, etc. SGM got it, though. He told us that he was just a nerd, and we lower enlisted sergeants and below were the geeks. And while he was trying to become a geek, he would trust us with the mission, and anything that we wanted to do as long as we could justify it. He would take it to the brass and keep the brass off our butts. So one day, SGM and I were walking and talking about some aspects of the mission, usual type stuff. We happen to walk past the CG office and we hear her from inside, SGM, OP, need to talk to you. So we look at each other and silently said to each other, now what? So we dutifully walk into his office and lock up, parade rest. SGM and me, yes sir. CG, yeah I was just wondering if it would be possible to have the Nippernet and Cipernet on my computer here. I don't want to have to go to another room to check the Cipernet. My gut just flipped. I just looked at SGM. SGM, OP, you want to handle this? <sighs> I could only imagine the look on my face towards the SGM. He had totally thrown me under the bus slash half track. I looked at the CG and took a breath. Me. Sir, permission to speak freely? CG. Of course, go ahead. I took a deep breath, say a very quick prayer, and look him dead in the eyes and said, Sir, are you outside your damn mind? <laughs> CG, taken aback. Excuse me, Specialist OP? Me. Sir, AR-25-2 clearly states that all nipper and sipper connections must be on different machines and the SIPR computers go through a completely different imaging procedure than the NIPR computers do. More policies are put in place to prevent removable media and other registry entries are put in place so that rogue software cannot be installed. But I tell you what, sir, if you want me to do that, fine. I'll do it under protest. While I'm at it, I'll put in a third network card to where you can have the top secret network on this unit so you won't have to go to the SCIF, the top secret secret squirrel building, to get your high level briefs and you won't be that far away from your coffee maker. And when all the alarms go off at the U.S. Army Europe National Guard Bureau, DOD, don't come crying to me. Oh, you want me to run it to the hooch too? Barracks. CG. Specialist. Me. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. CG. You've made your point. Both of you are dismissed. We about face and walk out. Get out to the hallway. SGM grabs my shoulder and spins me around and glares me down. SGM. Damn it, Specialist OP, you don't talk to a general that way. Me, I had permission to speak freely, and I was just quoting regulation and pointing out how insane his idea was. I did nothing wrong. SGM, just glaring at me and eventually turns into a smile. Good job, punches me on the shoulder. I've never sweated so many bullets. The next day I get a call from the CSM telling me to get to his office immediately. Oh boy. So I snap to, head over to the CSM office. Knock three times and he says, get in here now. Uh-oh. Me at parade rest. Yes, CSM? CSM. Specialist OP, what in the hell did you tell the old man yesterday? I knew the CG was out of the office because we enlisted only used that term behind his back. I know. Wrong. Me. CSM. I just reminded CG about the regulation regarding network protocols as described in Army Regulations 25-2. CSM. I know the regulation, Specialist OP. Me. Yes, CSM. 
He got up from his desk and walked right up in front of me. I'm about 5'11". He is well over 6 foot. Somewhat intimidating. CSM. You know what problem I really have, Specialist OP? No, CSM. I've been wanting to talk to him like that since the very beginning of the mission, and you got by with it. You know how bad that makes me look? I should bust you back to civilian. Me. I just did my job, CSM. CSM. I know, and you're damn good at it. Me. CSM, starting to smile and calm down. And that's why I'm so happy you're on this mission with us. Me, internally keeping my nerves in check. I'm honored to be here, CSM. CSM slaps me on the shoulder. At ease, OP. You did the right thing. Now, I do have an email problem. Me, internally eye-rolling and thinking, eh, figures. I helped CSM out and returned to my desk. I was promoted to sergeant a few weeks later. ETA. I want everyone here who said that I yelled at the general. I did not. I used a stern voice, yes, but I did not yell at him. I put that text in bold just to emphasize my frustration with such a request considering the security issues that we were already dealing with after the TOA. Transfer of authority that were left to us by the previous unit, and that request almost pushed me over the brink. While using sarcasm, I kept my composure and my voice at a respectful level. Also, I think that overall, my promotion was just a happy coincidence, and I'm not saying that event had anything to do with it. I had done my time, I had earned my stripes, and it was just weird that it happened so close to that event. Just a weird coincidence. Lastly, I appreciate all the upvotes and awards. I didn't expect this to blow up like it has. Who out all my military brothers and sisters? Good for you, OP, for standing up to the general like that. Even while keeping your voice at a respectful level and uh, being told that you could speak freely, that was taking an awful risk. Do you smell toast? Background. I'm an IT tech for a company that runs multiple private schools. I cover one school that has three buildings, one girl's site, two boys' sites. The boys are across the road. The girls, a bus slash tube away, only start in December, so still learning the details. Spent my morning at the girls, trying to untangle the mess of an uncompleted phone system. Main barrier being the network cables are wired into the lifts with no termination or notes of what ports they're using on the patch panel. Grab lunch and head to the boys for the afternoon. Just settled in with my coffee and checking through emails and tickets when I get a call. From the other boys' site, internet and phones have just died. Mobile call. Don't try to be clever, nitpickers. I head over and have a look. Yup, IP phones have no power and the Wi-Fi is deader than my social life. I find the network cab that hosts the phones and fiber, no power. Lights work, but power sockets seem to be dead. Wander next door to the staff room to try and find out what's going on. The toaster isn't working is the first thing I hear when I walk in. I can distinctively smell toast. Quickly, I stroke my beard. No numbness, I'm probably safe. Toast? I asked, puzzled. The toast was burning and I tried to fix it, blurted the upset teacher. Now I had a clue. Checked the staff room and yes, all the power sockets were down too. I unplugged the toaster and went in search for facilities. It was his second day, so was actually excited about fixing the issue. He went down into the basement to flip the breaker, reappearing a few minutes later saying there was no trip breaker down there. This started our hunt. In a move I'm sure Douglas Adams would approve of, we eventually found it. Above a ceiling tile, in a toilet, directly above the loo. With power fixed and offending toaster removed, everything came back up and everyone lived happily never after. Wait, there was a circuit breaker above a ceiling? I'm pretty sure no matter what country you're in, that's not anywhere near code. And do tell, did that teacher ever get their toast? I mean seriously, I can just picture it now. This toast started burning, they couldn't figure out how to trigger the, the lift on the toaster to get the toast out or to make it stop toasting, and uh, somebody had the bright idea to stick a knife in there to grab the bread and shorted it out. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Sorry this video is a little bit late. Ran into some technical issues last night, and uh, about 90% of them were up here. Ran into some glitches with the microphone, catching vibrations from the computer, and the camera shaking because it was connected to my monitor, which is supposed to be stable. Oh, listen, the song of our people. So I don't know if you guys can hear it, but my neighbor is running a demo saw so that he can cut slate for the sidewalk that he's installing in front of his house. He's a mason by trade. He's not doing anything illegal or rude. It's just my luck. If I decided to wait till Monday morning first thing to record this, guess who would be outside with a demo saw? The last place I lived, it was an old guy with a weed whacker and a leaf blower. Oh, well, let's read some stories. This first one's an email submission from James called Bad Chips. 
Long ago, a small company was started to make chips. This was all new technology, a heady time when it seemed anything could be done. The company was doing well but had a weird technical problem. The first run chips that were being made on Monday mornings were not passing QC. They only ran a five day week so the plant was shut down Friday and then restarted on Monday. For the less technical folks, chip fab is 1. Silicone wafers that are cut and polished. 2. Circuits are printed using photolithography. 3. Wafers are heated to set the print. Wafers are washed, number 4. Steps 2, 3, and 4 are repeated for every layer. Early chips had only a few layers. Number 5. The completed chips on the wafers are sliced apart. Number 6. Chip is set in its IC package. Number 7. The IC is tested. Back in the old days, at the start of the digital age, a lot of fabrication equipment wasn't custom made but was adopted from other industries. This becomes important. Time and money were spent to find out why they had this weird problem. The first runs on Monday yielded a low percentage of usable chips. Subsequent runs improved the percentage until the expected yields were reached. This went on for months. One Friday night, one of the founders of the company was out and stopped by late at night to pick up some papers. The plant was shut down and the cleaning crew was busy preparing it for the Monday start. He noticed the smell of pizza. The ovens used in step 3 were essentially commercial pizza ovens, so the cleanup crew was enjoying fresh baked pizza while they were working. This contaminated the ovens with organic compounds and those were eventually burned out by a series of heating runs. They had found their problem. Wow, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a totally clean environment, not like, well maybe it was. I don't know what kind of environment it was, but I can imagine like, you know, white Tyvek suits even back in the day or something similar, you know, kind of white glove clean because, you know, even back then they knew that contaminants in the silicone and everything would kind of ruin your circuitry. But, uh, yeah. Pizza grease from that steam when you're cooking them in the oven is just, yeah. That can't be good for circuit boards at all. Chips, whatever. Can't log in. I work in healthcare, but not IT. However, I'm generally the go-to guy for IT stuff in our clinic and have been deemed the clinic's super user for using our electronic medical record system, essentially making me tier one support for my colleagues. But that's not important to this story. I'm sitting in my office yesterday at lunchtime and I hear one of my colleagues, Dave, talking to a junior trainee, resident, Bob. Hey Bob, you use Macs, right? We don't use iMacs at work, so I know he's talking about his personal computer at home. I do, replied Bob. Well, I need some help. I bought this gorgeous 27-inch iMac and can't log in. And the conversation fades and I don't hear any more. Late that afternoon, I'm walking with Dave out to our vehicles to head home. Any exciting plans for the evening, I ask? No, I'm going up to the mall to go to the Apple store. I can't log into my iMac. Right, I overheard you talking to Bob about that at lunch. He wasn't able to help? Tell me what your issue is. Well, I had this iMac I bought a couple months ago. When I set it up, I logged in using a code on my Apple Watch. And since then, I just type a password to log in but for the past couple days I haven't been able to log in. I turn on the computer and it starts up, but then nothing. I click with my mouse and get the login box, but then it doesn't respond. I can move the mouse cursor, but I can't get it to do anything else. Hey Dave, have you charged your keyboard? What? The keyboard needs charging? Well, I said, since it's new, I'm assuming it's a wireless keyboard, so it runs on battery power. And for the past couple years, the iMac keyboards and mice don't use alkaline batteries. They have built-in rechargeable ones. There should have been a cable that came with it, and you just need to plug that into the keyboard and a USB port on the computer and you should be good to go. After a few hours, you can unplug it again. And for good measure, you should probably charge your mouse too. Give it a go and text me later to let me know if it works. Well, I was wondering what that cable was for. Two hours later, I get a text. You were right about the keyboard and mouse. Thanks for saving me a trip to the Apple store. So, you know, as a person of the male persuasion, I understand that sometimes we just kind of bull our way through things and don't read the directions and stuff like that, but if you got a wireless keyboard and you've never really had experience with one, wouldn't you be curious about what made it work? What made it tick? Like, my remote's wireless for my TV. It's not rechargeable. It still takes batteries. My phone. My phone is wireless. It doesn't take removable batteries, but it does need to be recharged. And oh, by the way, pretty much all cell phones for the last... 20 years plus have had rechargeable batteries, even since my big old brick Nextel push to talk phone. Oh well, at least he's got good co-workers that are willing to help. My friend is good with computers. A few weeks ago, a customer contacted us to tell us his PC wasn't powering on. Me, thank you for contacting computers, how can I help you? Customer, yes, I have a PC that's not booting. Me, I'm sorry to hear that, would you mind elaborating a bit more as to what's happening? Customer, well, when I turn it on, it's not turning on. 
I have my friend look at it and he tells me there's no power supply. He's really good with computers. Me, I'm sorry, so it's missing a power supply? Customer, yes, that's what he told me. When I go to turn it on, it shows the PC's splash screen saying SUS in search for imposter and then it just loses image. I can get to the BIOS screen but not anywhere past that. Me, wait, so it's not missing a power supply, it's just not booting into Windows then? If it had no power supply, you wouldn't have seen any of that. Customer, oh, well, what do I do then? Me, I'll go ahead and send you some instructions to get it booting for you. We got him back up and running, but either his friend is only good at pressing the power button, or he misheard his friend entirely. I love it, man. The friend sees a splash screen, sees that it can go into BIOS, and swears there's no power supply. The thing that gives it power so it can do those things. Yep, good at computers. Dad says I'm a good driver. Teacher in a classroom not knowing how to deal with a water-damaged laptop. This was a couple hours ago at the time of posting. I was in a classroom at this time. Let's call the teacher Jane and the student John. I wasn't looking at the time, but I think that John might have tilted an open water bottle. I immediately see it as I'm walking around the room and rush to shut down the wet laptop. And to get all of my tissues, yes, tissues, to clean the thing. As I'm rushing there, Jane says to turn on the wet laptop. Me. <sighs> you wouldn't want a sky-high replacement bill, right, Jane? Jane. Just turn it on. Me. No, that could probably kill the motherboard and the whole laptop as well. Jane. Well, that's like a 0.1% chance of happening, okay? Me. No, more like 65% chance right now. That's why I turned the laptop off. We cleaned the laptop the best we could and we turned it on. I had to plug the laptop in, but it did work. Jane. I told you so. Me. Um, it was because we cleaned the laptop, Jane. I'm not sure where anybody would think it was a good idea to get something that's electronic. Laptop, cell phone, tablet, whatever. Wet and then immediately turn it on. Like, in what universe is that ever a good idea? Like I've said before, I used to work in construction, and we had a guy who had a uh, an older skill brand worm drive saw. Worm drive saw is a little bit different. The blade's on the left-hand side, and it has a worm drive gear, which gives it a little more torque. The blade's a little smaller, but it's great for cutting, like when we used to hand-cut rafters for stick-built houses. I loved it when I was cutting off the stack of plywood for sheathing or anything else. I could, I could lay that saw down and run a straight line quicker than anybody. And uh, it was a little heavier, but, you know, because of the weight and the way it was designed, I mean, I could run a straight line over and over and over again, no problem. But this guy had one, and uh, he decided that it had a lot of dust in the brushes and stuff. And we had an air compressor at the time. Instead of just blowing it out at the end of the day and then wrapping the cord and putting it in the toolbox, he decided to go over to the fire hydrant where we had a regular garden hose set up to get our water for the masons and things like that. And uh, he turned the hose on it. That's not really that big a deal. You know, he could have doused it, shook it all out, set it out to dry, and, you know, used it. It was Friday, so he could have let it dry all weekend, and it probably would have been okay on Monday. But for some reason, he finished hosing it out and took it over. You know, he did mop off the outside with a towel, and then he took it right over to the power pole and plugged it in and started to run it. Well, the older skill saws had metal housings. As soon as he squeezed that trigger, it lit him right up. I mean, lit him up. His hair stood up. His boots were smoking. I'm pretty sure the saw never survived the fall after it got thrown about 30 feet <laughs> from the shock. But, uh, yeah, just not a good idea, folks. My internet's not working. Video has no sound. So I work in tech support for an internet TV phone provider. A couple days ago, I get the seemingly typical call. Older lady starts with, my internet's not working, blah, blah. I think, okay, let's check. I look at the settings on the modem. I see three devices connected. I tell her that I see the Wi-Fi is in fact working, but with the benefit of the doubt, I ask, what device are you using? Can you check if it says connected, no Wi-Fi? Lady's confused. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. After 10 minutes of talking, it turns out the sound on her laptop or on her YouTube video she's watching is off. But I'm a kind-hearted kind of gal and decided that even though it's not my problem, I'll help. It's going to be easy. That's where I effed up. I'm not going to describe the conversation, but it was basically me telling her to find the speaker icon on the bottom of the screen. She has the YouTube video on full screen. Her whispering the word speaker for five minutes, me asking if she found it, and her now again being utterly confused at the instruction I gave. This goes on for about 20 minutes in total, so I finally tell her to close the YouTube video and look for a speaker icon on the bar on the bottom of the screen. Another 20 minutes pass and nothing. She says she doesn't have that. So I instruct her to go to the control panel. 
The process is the same. She whispers control panel for five minutes. I keep giving her different instructions, changing ways we can get to the volume settings, and then she goes into the whispering again. Not talking much, not asking me any questions, just whispering. In the meantime, her husband yells, you off the phone already? Periodically. It now turned into a one hour long call and we're nowhere close to finding volume settings. I'm patient, but I'm getting more and more worried that we'll never find it. I tried every trick in the book to make it easier for her to find the volume setting. I'm sweating. The old lady's not giving up. It's been one hour and 40 minutes. We didn't reach the volume setting, and I don't believe it. After spending all this time on this woman, the call drops. Can't reach the customer back. I never felt so relieved and so defeated at the same time. I hope she found a way to turn the volume on. Yeah, it can be frustrating to describe things over the phone to anybody, especially to older people if they're not used to technology. Ashtrays on the disk drives? This is an early 80s mainframe story. Back then, I worked worldwide software support for the DBMS supplied by the UK mainframe manufacturer ICL that ran on their 1900 range of machines and used to have to go on site a lot. Back then in the dark ages, computer rooms were environmentally controlled sanctums with sticky masks to try and minimize walk-in dust. Filtered air that was temperature and humidity controlled. You get the picture. Part of the reason for this was the type of disk drives that were still in use. Disk drives back in those days were something else. Contraptions the size of washing machines that had a capacity of 30 to 80 megabytes. <laughs> Not a mistype. Held on exchangeable disk packs that were themselves 12 inch diameter multi-platter monstrosities that weighed about 10 pounds. Changing a disk pack was quite the operation. Offline the disk on the operator console. Hit the stop button on the drive. Wait for the disk to spin down. Hit the open button. Extract the disk using the carrier slash cover. Screw in the replacement disk. Close the lid and hit the start button. Once the disk had spun up to speed, the read-write heads would fire out and fly above the platters at a distance of only a few one thousandths of an inch. If any foreign matter got in there, well, things could go south fast. When you have 10 pounds of metal spinning at a couple hundred RPM, well, stop thinking memory stick and start thinking industrial lathe. What has all this got to do with smoking? As I said earlier, most computer rooms were almost controlled to clean room standards. Not in France. Oh no, not in France. In France, on one side I visited, they had installed ashtrays on the sides of the disk drives, so at least that way I've got the operators to agree to remove their cigarette from their mouths while they're swapping disks. Sometimes I wonder if it was a fever dream. Even back then, I can't even imagine smoking around the equipment in a clean room environment. Well, it's amazing we've all survived as long as we have as a species, really. He's my husband. First time poster after landing my first full-time tech support job. Very short, but I thought it appropriate. Hi, welcome to company name. This is Jack. How can I help? Can I speak to Darren, please? Yep, I'll see if he's online. Can I ask who's calling and what the call is concerning? Oh, he's my husband. If he's not at his desk, I'll just call him directly. Oh, uh, thanks, and they hang up. A very similar bonus story. Hi, right, could I speak to Adam, please? One second, I'll just see if he's available. I'm afraid he's in a meeting at the moment. Can I pass a message on to him? Oh, no, that's fine. I'll just ring him directly. Thanks anyway. I didn't realize service desk meant part-time reception. I was a quality control manager for a uh, Sears authorized remodeling company <laughs> way back in the 90s. And uh, my job was to go on site and inspect roofs, garage doors, entry doors, storm doors, whatever, just to make sure the customers were happy, Sears standards were met, yada yada, and uh, take pictures of the job so I could close out the file. When I was in the office, my job was to field complaint calls and things like that. And usually they were messages that were left for me or they were in the Sears system and I got a dot matrix printout, what their complaint was and their phone number, etc. But every time I was in the office, if I was in the office for two hours, I spent about an hour and 15 to 20 minutes answering the phones, like the general incoming line to the office. We had one dedicated secretary just for reception, which we didn't get much in, the, in our office. We had an office just to stay organized. It wasn't like a storefront or anything. And she would also do phone calls. And then we had a coordinator who would work between customers and contractors directly to schedule times for installations and things like that. Amazing. For an hour and 15 minutes out of my two hour slot in the office and nobody was available to answer phones. And while we got a lot of phone calls in a day, we didn't get that many phone calls. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to say sorry ahead of time for any glitches that might happen during this recording. I'm doing a little experimenting with different, uh, different recording software, audio and visual. And uh, this is a whole new program. So hopefully the color correction looks a little better. 
Maybe I look a little clearer. Not that you give a crap about me because there's a cat down there. Why would you? Nah. Just let me know what you think. Opinions always welcome. Nice opinions are always welcome. Or respectful opinions. All right. Let's read some stories. Fine. You choose. Once upon a time, there were legendary beings called TV repairmen. These majestic creatures were often seen coming to the rescue when the big box in your house stopped showing moving pictures, making sounds, or any combination of those things. Yours truly was a member of this once proud tribe, now made all but extinct by cheap throwaway televisions and overly hard to service large screen sets. Even back then, it was often a battle for the TV guy to be considered anything but a crook. People didn't like it when the magic box stopped working, but they really didn't like having to pay someone to fix it. Anyone who's worked in this field for long has a long list of crazy customer stories, and I'll be happy to share a few if there is interest, but I will share this one today for my own satisfaction. It's important to understand that there are a myriad of things that can go wrong with a TV set. The sound can be off, distorted, or just sound funny. Funny how? I mean funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? The picture likewise can be distorted. The colors can be out of adjustment. The signal can be weak or the set may just be dead. The dead ones were by far the easiest to fix. You had a concrete problem. The biggest headaches came in when the problem wasn't quite so obvious. Every TV guy knew the complaint, and it made our hearts drop in our chests to hear it. It just doesn't look right. Or maybe, the color just isn't right. These descriptions can be very obvious, like when the weatherman's face is pea green, but they can also be very, very subjective, a problem in the eye of the beholder. I've worked on many a set and had it looking, to my eye, crystal clear and showroom fresh, only to have the customer tell me that it still doesn't look right. That was the case the afternoon of my story. I was at the house of one of our regular customers, a woman who was known for coming up with the most nebulous and hard to diagnose problems. Many we firmly believe existed only in her head. She still persisted in calling us, and on the day in question I found myself seated behind her big console TV trying to find out why it didn't look right. A mirror on a stand in front of the set showed me the results of everything I did, and I'd been working on the set for over an hour without being able to successfully make it look right. My knees were hurting. My ego was damaged. I was this customer's favorite, and I was failing her. It was getting late in the day, and she was happily sitting in her chair passing judgment on every adjustment. I heard, better, worse, no difference, but never that we were done. It was obvious to me that whatever the mysterious thing that she was waiting to see was never going to materialize. The picture was crisp, clear, balanced, and beautiful. Then, in the midst of my preparations for Harry Carey, an idea occurred to me. I was going to let her have some involvement. I still can't believe that I even thought of this, much less that I actually did it. Such was the depth of the despair I was feeling. You see, on the old sets with picture tubes, it was possible to adjust the vertical and horizontal picture synchronization. Without going too deep into the techie part, if your picture's vertical sync got out of adjustment, the picture would appear to roll, like a film strip being pulled across the light. The picture would continue to roll until the vertical hole was adjusted, and the control was sitting right in front of me. I started my rather audacious plan. Ma'am, I've got it very close, but I'm going to need your help to get the perfect picture locked in. I'm going to scan through a series of pictures, and when you see the one that looks right, let me know so I can lock it in for you. The lady was kind of excited. She'd never been asked to help before. She leaned in, and I very slightly adjusted the vertical hold so the picture started to slowly roll. She watched intently for several frames and then suddenly exclaimed, There! Stop! Ooh, can you go back one? With a happy, yes ma'am, I stopped the roll and carefully let it roll backwards once. There, there, that's perfect, she exclaimed. I very carefully locked it in, made sure that everything was in order, and put the back of the set back on. My customer was positively bubbling as she signed my service ticket and saw me to the door. I left the employment of this particular shop a few months later, moving forward in my telecom career. So I never responded to this lady's house again, but the other tech on the bench at the shop later told me that she was satisfied with that set for a long time. I never had the call to try that again, and my coworker admitted that he could never work up the nerve. I still can't believe that I not only did it, but got away with it. And down below in the comments from Old Grey Troll we have, Back in about 1977, I took a TV repair course at my local community college. Tubes, pots, learn how to use a high voltage probe. Fun fact, high voltage probes have very sharp tips. Second fun fact, high voltage makes your muscles contract uncontrollably. Third fun fact, touch the wrong place on the TV while you're taking high voltage measurements of the picture tube, It'll cause your bicep to spasm and drive the high voltage probe towards your throat at a high velocity. If you're lucky, you scratch your neck instead of plunging the needle tip into your throat. I am very lucky. In just about this time, solid state TVs hit the market big time, and my knowledge became obsolete almost immediately. 
So I became a computer programmer. When I was a kid, I had a, I don't know, 12 inch black and white, maybe 14 inch black and white TV in my room. You know, the one, the one that's missing the UHF channel changing knob and the, usually the on and off slash volume knob. Uh, usually it got pulled off and lost somewhere, but as long as I had a pair of needle nose close by, I could make all that work. But in the back of the set exposed, now this was 1980, 80, 81, somewhere in there. The vertical and horizontal holds were accessible outside the TV case. So I don't know what time frame this guy's working on or anything. Mine probably wasn't a tube TV, so I'm not sure, but it was totally there. I mean, you needed a small point. Usually I used a steak knife to adjust mine. And I'm not sure why it went out of adjustment, but every so often I had to mess with it just to get everything just right. Man, I still remember Saturday mornings watching the Three Stooges on that TV, trying to keep the volume as low as possible because I hadn't asked permission to watch TV yet, so I was kind of sneaking. Oh goody, another one for me to butcher. Just hire Zephrim Cochran. That says Cotrain, I'm going to commit Harry Carey. Circa 1980, I was working for a timesharing vendor in the U.S. Access to our computers was via our own dial-up network. Since most of our customers were in the U.S. and Europe, that's where our computers were. One day I got a call from one of our sales reps screaming that his new customer in Australia was complaining about lousy response time. We had to fix this immediately since this customer was potentially worth thousands of dollars each month. Our monitoring software showed that we were consistently meeting our SLA, service level agreement, of 2.5 seconds, so I asked for details. Often bad response time was due to problems with the local telephone service, especially in rural areas. For all I knew, this customer was at a cattle station in the outback. Nope, the customer was in a brand new office building in Perth, just a few blocks from our access point. Okay, sometimes response times just seem bad, but when you actually measure it, it's within the SLA. Nope, this customer was running a script that issued a set of commands and recorded the response time. His numbers showed it was between 1.5 and 2.25 seconds. So what was he complaining about? And why was he running his own response time monitor? We charged for connect time and usage, so he was paying for what was in effect an extra user that was signed on all day and running this script. Except he wasn't, and he wasn't even complaining. In fact, he was delighted. The salesman was so eager to make the sale that he changed the SLA to guarantee sub-second response time. Since we weren't meeting the SLA, we couldn't bill him. So this customer was using our service for free. The salesman was the one complaining since his commission was based on billing. I sent him an email explaining that the communications link between Australia and the US was via a satellite in a geosynchronous orbit about 22,300 miles above the Earth. Since data travels at the speed of light, which is about 186,000 miles per hour, it took more than half a second just to send the command to us and the response back. That leaves us with less than half a second to process it. In order to meet his SLA, we would have to build a computer center in Australia at a cost of about $1 million a month. We both knew that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. He demanded that I come up with another solution, preferably before the next billing cycle. Every few days, the sales rep called me wanting to know if I had a solution. Finally, I said I had. All we needed to do was figure out a way to send data faster than the speed of light, kind of like warp drive on Star Trek. I was sure there was a few Nobel laureate physicists who would love to come work for us. I suggested he submit his idea using our formal suggestion process. Management had a better idea. They decided we really didn't need a sales rep who signed contracts like that without the approval of the technical and legal staff. As far as I know, this customer used our service for free until PCs came along and commercial time sharing went the way of punched cards and paper tape. Yeah, this is an age old problem. As long as there have been salesmen on this earth, there's usually a customer right behind them with unrealistic expectations. Can't say that word today. Here's a hint, if you're going into sales, and I suck at sales, but let me tell you something, one thing, one thing, if you take nothing else, stop overselling the job. Don't promise them the moon if all we can do is give them a snapshot of it. That's it, simple. User needs a splitter. So along with my regular day-to-day -day computer technician position, I also work in procurement for the IT department of a large organization. Yesterday, I popped into my email and read a computer equipment request form that had several items listed, such as a headset for Zoom meetings, a new mouse, etc. All low-budget items that we have in stock and would normally be approved right away. But for the last item on their list, they asked for a splitter. That's it. No other information, just a splitter. So I email them back asking what kind of splitter they require. Are they trying to split audio, video, or something else? Today I got my response, which basically just said, it's been 24 hours, where's my equipment? <sighs> Thanks for not answering my question. 
I noticed that they're in the same building as me, so I decide to wander on over and ask them directly what exactly they meant by splitter. She tells me that she can't plug all this stuff in at the same time, that there's only one available USB port in the front of her computer. So she's asking for a splitter so that she can plug more than one item in at a time, such as a headset as well as a webcam for Zoom meetings. Ah, so a USB hub is what she wants. But wait a second, what about the USB ports on the back of her computer? Eventually, I get back to my office and approve the equipment request, except for one item. In the area where I explained why the request was denied, I wrote, Today I taught a user that there are USB ports on the back of her computer and not just the front. Three ports available. I mean, it sounds innocent enough. I get it. She only knows of the one USB port, and she knows she's going to have multiple USB items that need to be plugged in. So I get that. And I get her confusion that, you know, most of them, thank God, she's not one of those that keeps pulling her computer out and messing with things on the back that she shouldn't. But at the same time, you sent her a message asking. She could have answered and said, I'm not really sure. I just know I'm going to have a bunch of things to plug in and only one USB hub. Now, the conversation would have been so fast and you could have explained it all, but she chose to ignore it anyway. Fabulous. $500 mainboard DDR4 compatibility. So I recently sold my used Gigabyte Z170X Gaming G1 motherboard on eBay and shipped it to Sweden. The buyer contacted me a few days later that the motherboard was defective. He was not getting a picture through either the onboard GPU or his external GPU. The error message. Error 23 allowed me to narrow it down to a problem with the RAM. In addition to the usual questions about whether the memory is properly seated and he's already reset the CMOS, which he's done everything. I read through the manual of the motherboard. On the product page, I found a compatibility list for the RAM and sent it to him and asked if his memory is listed there. He was using a HyperX Fury 3600 DDR4 memory, which was not listed. He was able to borrow a different stick and boot with it. That was the mistake. This brand of memory is not compatible with a $500 motherboard. Hours wasted on troubleshooting for that. This is just a short story, but I was fascinated that compatibility problems are still around these days. I've been pretty lucky over the years. I've either had motherboards where it really didn't much matter, you know, except for finding out if it's DDR2, 3, or 4. Um, but, you know, most of the time I just get something close and stick it in there and it works. But the motherboard I have now isn't, you know, like exactly high end. And when I expanded it to 32 gig of RAM, I actually just went and looked at what brand was in there that this assembler used and just went with the same exact stuff, same specs and everything. So that way I kind of knew it was going to work. But yeah, it's good to know. The user bubble of alternate reality. Most of my immediate and extended family live within 60 miles of each other except for one family who lives most of the way across the country. Because of this, it's a pretty big deal when they find the time and money to fly in and visit. A few weeks ago, exactly this happened, and there were plenty of family get-togethers as a result. Interestingly, the out-of-town uncle-in-law's family also lives near the rest of us, so a few of those events included many of his relatives that I'm not familiar with. So I'm technically at an event with strangers, but it feels like family which is what I'm blaming for my guard being down. Me. So what do you do? Stranger. I'm a dermatologist. Me. Interesting. I've heard that's the best income versus emergency field of medicine to be in. Is that true? Do you ever get dermatological emergencies? Stranger laughing. No, you might be right. Unfortunately, you still get plenty of people stopping you asking for free medical advice. And as a dermatologist, it's never something you want to see and rarely something you want to talk about. Me. Oh God. That's gotta be terrible. I feel your pain. What is it about some professions that make people act so rude? I have stylist friends and I've never asked for a free haircut. Stranger. I don't know. So what is it that you do? Me. I'm an IT. Technically, I'm a network engineer. Stranger. Oh, so I have this laptop that's been running slow. What do you think is the problem? Me. So the guy... Wait, so the guy just got done complaining about somebody asking him stuff, you know, outside of work about whatever their skin issues might be and not getting paid for it and really not wanting to deal with it off the clock just to turn around and throw this in the tech family member's lap. I really hope he was joking, but the, the story stops there. So who knows? Maybe he was just being sarcastic. I doubt it, though. Hey, guys, welcome back to the channel. I want to start off by saying thank you so much to those of you who listen and watch the videos and uh, submit your own stories. Email is who's your uncle LLC at gmail.com. Feel free to send your stories over and uh, yeah, we'll put them on the channel. All right, let's read some stories. This one is from listener sad gut. My partner and I aren't in it, but we know enough about tech that we're the family's number one contact people for computer issues. It used to be my father-in-law. 
He was a diesel mechanic by trade and job, but he was a guru with computers too. He died about 10 years ago, and that family IT role fell to us. Normally no problems, simple fixes for us to be done over the phone. The exception to that rule was always my mother-in-law. Somehow she thinks she knows about computers, probably by osmosis from her husband, but is actually worse than all the others combined because of Dunning-Kruger effect. Anyway, about a year after father-in-law died, mother-in-law's home router failed. We managed to talk her through setting up the router and better yet, her desktop computer hooked up to it. Her new laptop hooked up and she insisted on setting up father-in-law's machine. She never used it, but hey, we weren't going to start her grieving again by saying that nobody's there to use it. What we forgot was to hook up her printer. So a few weeks later, she went to use her printer and it didn't work. So we get the panicked phone call where she proceeded to tell us how she had changed all the cartridges, paper, restarted her computer and printer several times to no avail. My partner and I are both looking at each other, biting our tongues as we knew instantly what was wrong. When mother-in-law ran out of steam, my partner tried to explain that her mom's printer was still looking for the old network, so it wasn't talking to her computer. 10 minutes of hair pulling, simpler and simpler wording and anecdotes to explain the problem, but she's just unable to get it. Eventually, we gave up trying to explain it to her and decided to just talk her through it step by step. My partner tells her to go to the printer while we look up the manual online. Tell her to go into the printer settings. She takes a little longer to do that than we thought it should have taken, but we didn't see it as a problem. But as we're telling her the next step, she couldn't find any of the options we needed. So we start again. We tell her to go to the printer, press the home button below the little screen and go to settings. Same issues. Can't see what we need her to. Repeat three or four times. Finally, my partner, MP, clicks and asks, where are you? Mother-in-law, in the printer settings screen. MP, no, like we're in your house. Mother-in-law, at the desktop. <laughs> Nowhere near her printer. MP, no, we need you to go into the settings on the printer. So go back to the printer and press the home button. Use the arrows on the screen to find settings. Mother-in-law, okay. MP, now press the button to go into the settings. Mother-in-law, okay. MP, now look for connections. Mother-in-law, where's that? Confused look on both our faces. It should have been the second or third option down on the list. Me, mother-in-law, where are you? Mother-in-law, at the computer. Cue frustrated howl from my partner and the phone goes flying across the room, followed by her stomping out of the room. <laughs> I retrieve the phone. Surprisingly, it still works, and more surprisingly, still connected to the call. Mother-in-law is panicked, thinking something major had happened. I apologized and tried to take over. Me, go to the printer settings. Mother-in-law, okay. Me, where are you? Mother-in-law, at the computer. Now I'm pulling my hair out by the root. Me, go to the effing printer. MP, the piece of plastic where the paper comes out. Mother-in-law, never having heard me swear at her. Oh, I'd sworn about her, but never to her before. Okay. MP, now forget your computer printer settings exist. Until I say otherwise, the only thing that exists is the plastic machine known as the printer. Mother-in-law, tears are now audible. <laughs> okay. Me, go into the printer settings. Eventually, MP and I got her to understand that the printer had all the settings correct and got her printing okay. So that's why we enjoy listening to these stories. We know enough to sympathize. I would hate to do it as a job. I've had similar experiences with people in my house, people in my family, people at work. You say things like, go to the printer. No, not on your computer. Like, get up and walk to the printer. And for some reason, they just can't get that through their heads. And then, you know, once you think they've got that part and you ask them again, where are you? At my computer. <laughs> Thanks for the submission. Oh, that was gold. Oh no, I skipped those steps. At work, we've got a ticketing system, which we introduced in 2020 as the pandemic was ramping up. My boss made it very clear to everyone. No more walk-ups, unless your computer is so broken that you can't put a ticket in. Most people adhere to that, except one person. Let's call her Sue. Sue's an older lady and is steadfast in her refusal to learn how to use computers. She's very manipulative when it comes to this. Sometimes she'll lure you into conversation asking how your weekend was, and use that as a segue into, oh, while you're here, can you do this for me? Other times she'll sit out in front of the office in the shared working space, and as you walk past, sigh audibly or mutter, hoping you'll say, oh, what's wrong, Sue? 
Other times she'll just barge on in and look for the first person to make eye contact with her, put her computer down in front of them, blurt out her issue, and get that person to fix it for her. Once she even complimented my computer skills to try and get me to drop my guard and create some folders on her desktop. Yes, really. I'm wise to her crap and will gladly send her out of the office to put a ticket in, and say we'll ask her to come in only if we need to look at her computer. Often she'll respond to our instructions with, oh that didn't work, so that we have no choice but to ask her to come in because clicking a team viewer link is like pulling teeth. One day she had put a ticket in for something that was a known issue. I replied with step-by-step -step instructions which included screenshots with all the buttons you need to click circled. There were seven steps in total. About 20 minutes later she came barging in saying, those steps didn't work. Me, being wise to her crap, asked her to sit down and follow those steps again while she was in the office. Sue then acted flustered, not sure how to switch between the instructions and what she was asked to do. She knew, she just acted dumb. But after a bit of huffing and puffing, she started. About a minute later, she said, those steps still didn't work. I asked what steps she got up to and she said, step six. I looked on the screen and saw she'd only done steps one and two. I asked her if she'd done steps three through five and she said dismissively, oh no, I skipped those steps. Sue had seven steps to follow. Total time to complete these steps would have been two minutes at the very most, and she decided to skip three entire steps. I told her to follow the steps again, in their entirety, not skipping a single one. And what do you know? The issue was resolved and she acted surprised. In her spare time, this woman loves to bake. We know because she's brought us in food before to butter us up for a barrage of questions a day or two later. So she knows the importance of following instructions. She just refused to do them this time because she wanted someone else to do it for her. You know, I wonder if that's what mother-in-law in the last story was doing. If she was just trying to play dumb to get somebody to come like keep her company and actually put their hands on the computer and printer. Either way though, there's a lot of older people I know that are manipulative like that. They think they can suck up with baked goods and sweet talk and compliments. Sometimes it works, honestly. When you're in a corporate environment like that though, people need to learn how to follow instructions, otherwise everything just goes to crap fast. Oh well. You almost burned down their effing store! Dear Diary, November 12th, 2002. Help! Why didn't mom ever tell me not to use bleach to get the smell of burned fur off my skin? P.S. The Employee Assistance Program Counselor says there isn't a Section 8 discharge as a civvy. I guess I'm stuck here even longer. Animals, large or small, like warm things. Laps, fireplace hearths, cows, don't ask. The list is long. But when you have a vertical tower with a top mounted power supply and a top intake fan, well, let's just say things can get pretty heated. The setting, a crisp, cold, sunny day about 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus one degree Celsius if I recall correctly, which is unusually cold for that time of year in our neck of the woods. The players, me, customer, customer's husband, other techs, front end staff. Other tech one brings a PC with ticket back from the intake desk and drops it on the bench. They said it just randomly shuts off for no apparent reason. I popped it open and it wasn't too bad, but I'm gonna take it out back and blow it out anyway. Other tech one comes back in a few minutes and plops it on the bench and hooks it up. Me, you gonna run the stress test on it? Other tech one, I was gonna do graphics benchmarks first in case it was just a video card. If it's that, it'll save some time. Me. Okay. Several hours pass. Other tech one. Well, that system from this morning's running okay, so I'm gonna boot into the stress test. Our stress test app booted up into Linux image, which allocated most of the RAM as virtual disk, and then spawned multiple threads to read write to the VDisk, real disk, stress the CPU with a math suite, and also decode some video at the same time. It was pretty effective. Next morning, the system is hung. No, not like that. Get your mind out of the gutter. And the shop smells a little funky. We spent about an hour trying to locate the source of the smell without a lot of success. Partly I suspect because our HVAC was a recirculating type so it tended to homogenize the air throughout the building. It was fading though so we figured it was probably something from outside overnight. Other Tech 1 was off so Other Tech 2 took over. The system was powered up but just totally frozen. Other Tech 2 started testing individual components and test systems. Hard disk drive appeared good. Video card appeared good, etc. Eventually he hooked up the power supply to our load tester and he and I went to lunch across town. Cell phone rings. You guys need to get back quick. Something's on fire in the shop. Well, that's not good. We arrived to find a fire crew, fire chief, and all the store staff standing around outside. No hoses going into the building or anything, so that's one positive, I guess. Me. 
What happened? Front end one. About 10 minutes after you left, smoke started pouring out of the shop. It reeked. This training is being done over video and chat, so there's the usual hellos at the start. Introduce fire chief. You guys can go back in anytime. We've evacuated most of the smoke from the building. There wasn't any actual fire. Other tech too. Well, what was it? Fire chief. Some gadget on one of the benches back there was pouring smoke out like a fog machine. Other tech too and I looked at each other. Gadget on one of the benches? We walk in and see smoke curling off the aforementioned power supply. And oh my gosh, it was nauseating. Burnt hair. Not the burnt electronic smell we were expecting. Clearly burnt hair. What the frack? We pulled the shop video up and about five minutes after we left, Other Tech 3 went to the front. While they were there, the power supply started spewing a greasy grayish smoke. A few sputters of flame did make attempts to burn us to the ground, but fortunately they self-extinguished. We looked at each other and promptly said, Not it! Me. Hey, Other Tech 3, we need you to take this power supply apart. Other Tech 2. Have fun! Other Tech 3. F you guys. Inside the power supply were the remains of massive amounts of fur, to the point that while the fan would spin, there literally was no path for the air to flow through. Me. Other Tech 1 said he blew this out. Other Tech 2. Well, he's full of crap. So I called the customer. Hi, customer's husband. Hey, we think we found the problem. How long have you had this PC and do you by chance have a dog or cat or other pet with medium to long fur? Customer's husband. Yeah, we have a couple cats and a small dog and I think we bought the computer at Christmas a couple years ago. Why? What's the matter with it? Me. Well, your power supply pretty much blew up during our testing and we had to evacuate the store because of the smoke from the burnt hair. Silence. Me. Customer's husband, you still there? Customer's husband. Muffled background yelling. Damn it, spouse. How many effing times have I told you to keep the damn cats off the computer? You almost burnt down their effing store. More background yelling. Customer's husband. Resigned in depressed tone. Can you fix it? Me. Oh, sure. Looks like the only problem was the power supply and we have them in stock. You should be able to pick it up tomorrow. After we test it again. In the parking lot. Customer's husband. Yeah, that's probably smart. How much? Me thinking rapidly. Probably about three hours of labor. $39 for the power supply. And three big bags of dry cat food plus tax. <laughs> Silence. Customer's husband. Cat food? Me. Yeah, you can run it over to the animal shelter as a donation. We'll list it on your bill. Epilogue. Six months later, a customer came to the back to enter their password for me. <laughs> customer. Do you smell burnt hair? Me. Every day. Every bloody day. P.S. I checked with the animal shelter a couple weeks later and the customer actually did take some bags of cat food over to them for a donation. That's one of the worst parts about dealing with other people's stuff. you got to deal with their habits, whether they smoke, vape, whatever. Their animals. Hair, obviously. Or, if they weren't very clean in their house, you know, maybe the faint smell of cat urine from either spraying the tower or just being in a room with an unclean litter box. Bugs, dust, you name it. Ugh. That's why I'm kind of glad I don't do remodels anymore. Because even commercial remodels, we used to go in at night... Another carpentry story. Shocker, I know. We used to go into KFCs at night and do their front end remodels. This was, uh, I don't know, what, 26, 7 years ago, something like that. At that point, KFC had redesigned their whole front counter line uh, with new pastel colors, and it was kind of cool and jazzy for that time period. And uh, a new bulletproof glass with the bulletproof glass carousels, you know, they put your bag in and spin it after you put your cash on and spun it around and yeah, city restaurants are cool, but I don't care how much of a neat freak your manager is in that store. It's nasty. It's old cooking grease, usually some kind of bugs, mostly roaches. I mean, they're pretty common in every restaurant, but yeah, just dust from where people don't really get behind equipment and things, which is good because, you know, like we're behind the registers and things, all the wires and cables hanging down. If they actually got in there and cleaned, they'd probably disconnect half their crap and yeah, that's a whole other mess, but well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Evidently, I need a digital assistant to remind me to press record when I start these things. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, what do y'all think of my fancy little RGB lights back there? Not much, but, you know, little visual interest. You know, you got a cat in one corner, blue and purple lights in the other corner. Eh, I just got tired of the black hole or the generic room light. 
back there. So, all right, let's read some stories. Right, Nickel? Yeah, I'll get back to you later. Testing the UPS. So back in the before times, in the roundup to Y2K, I worked for a call center in Southern California. I had been part of the crew that was going around to each of our 1,000 plus workstations and confirming or patching the BIOS to stave off the Y2K bug. Our largest client, still a world leader in telecom, was rightfully paranoid about crashes and general call availability. To this end, they wanted confirmation we were ready for all the potential disasters Y2K would bring. As part of that, we tested our UPS system several times. We had several banks of batteries for the servers and network infrastructure, but these were rated for only about 15 minutes of power, while the backup generator kicked off. It took five or six minutes for the generators to come up to operating temperature and be ready for the load they were intended to handle. The first time we ran it, there was a mechanical failure, and the gen set didn't get up before the batteries faded. The second time we found a wiring fault, and not all the server racks were wired to the gen set. Third test worked great, everything went as planned. Fourth test was done in front of the client reps on a weekend. After that, we did a full up live test in the middle of the week in front of the client's regional VPs. That was an extended run lasting most of my shift. Y2K came and by this time I was promoted to a floor supervisor. All hands on deck New Year's Eve 1999 just in case the apocalypse happened. It didn't. We all let out a collective sigh of relief and went on with our lives. Until March 5th of 2000, when Southwest Airlines Flight 1455 overran the Burbank Airport runway, rolled across the street and knocked down some power lines. We lost power, but the batteries kicked on. Genset came up and our employees restarted their workstations without dropping a call. All planned for smooth transition. Until about 15 minutes later, when the genset spun down. People started scratching their heads and then about 5 minutes later the servers started shutting down from loss of battery power. Apparently after all the testing we did and the prep for Y2K, no one thought to refill the fuel tanks for the generators. Oops. Dude, gotta love it. Big time company like that getting ready to spend all kinds of money on Y2K bugs and being prepared and they don't have a maintenance guy that checks that generator every so often or a company that comes in to check it and, you know, exercise a generator about once a month or once a quarter to, you know, make sure the fuel's running good, the oil's good, make sure the fuel's topped off, make sure it's actually powering things. That's kind of standard for anybody who's got a backup generator. I don't know. Old time tale. Circa 1994. Oh, stop it. Panicked phone call from the help desk. No one can access the system. Great. Let me head down to the server room and check everything out. This was a 500 person law firm with eight 25 port mini computers. All 25 ports of each server was connected to a MyCom RS-232 switch. The MyCom allowed users to connect from their dumb terminals to an open port on any of the servers. Note that all the dumb terminals were hardwired via RS-232 ports to concentrators on each floor of the building. I take a look and the MyCom config is blown, as in factory reset. So as I began the process of restoring the configuration, at 300 baht if I remember correctly, it comes out that a DEC tech was in the server room, pulled a floor tile looking for power and randomly pulled a power cable to plug his equipment into. His excuse was, mm, it sounded just like a fan. Four hours later the MyCom config is reloaded. Turns out the battery on the main controller board had failed, causing the config to be lost when the power was pulled. DEC got a bill from the firm for the $100,000 per hour, ouch, downtime the tech caused. Okay, I'm kind of on the fence with this one. So he should have gotten a bill for sure for pulling a plug he knew nothing about. But at the same time, again, this is a maintenance issue. Whose responsibility was it to make sure that the backup battery to save all your information and configurations was okay just in case the power went out? Like nobody thinks about maintenance stuff anymore. It's, it's just mind blowing. Let's get our users to learn how to save space, but maybe not us. This is from about 25 years ago. I worked in an IT department that supported a division of our company. At the time, we were still rolling out desktop computers to people. Some departments just had a central terminal they used to log into a VAX for email and certain applications. One of the things we discovered was that folks getting a personal computer often didn't think about deleting stuff. They would just keep saving files or making copies and didn't have any awareness about the limits of disk space and such. As I was involved in our help desk and could put together some simple websites, I was asked to work with someone on developing a website to teach people about how to reduce their use of space eating things like emails, files, personal stuff, and so on. We came up with a sort of film noir detective concept, only he figured out space wasting capers. We had different adventures that were written as the denouement, denouement. Oh my God. of each story and 
Each story related to a specific concept like knowing record retention guidelines or how to check the amount of data used in a directory or your email. They would have multiple choice answers to reaffirm the concept. Picking the right one lets you leave your employee number so you can participate in a prize drawing. Management was really excited about this and said we should take a snapshot of how much space was used on our servers before we sent this out and a week after. We would have a random drawing to give out gift certificates to the cafeteria, so everything got set up. It was cool seeing the information come in as the number of visits increased and people were talking about the little stories and the character we'd made up. After the week was over, we talked to the system operators to get the size snapshot. And data storage was much greater than it had been before we started. It turned out that the manager of our organization decided to share a bunch of scanned pictures from a Halloween party we'd had recently and he attached the files and used everyone's name as an individual instead of a group distribution list, one of the techniques we had a story about. The huge image files copied in each email to each individual blew the disk usage way up. We did have the drawing, but we didn't make any announcements about how much space we saved from the effort. Do as I say, not as I do. I had a boss once, direct supervisor. He was actually a uh, son to the owner of the company, and you know he kept doing this little fist pounding thing, you know, got to save fuel, got to save fuel in our trucks. Okay. So, you know, no more sitting idling. If it was 90 some degrees out Fahrenheit in the summertime, uh, no air conditioning during lunch. So we'd have to find a shade tree or some shady spot, not in the truck, which was just basically a big oven. You know, if we stopped for breakfast in the morning on the way to the job, we had to shut the truck off. No sitting there letting it idle with one person in it while somebody ran into the store, things like that. Fair enough. We, you know, hey, we're all good with that. But this same supervisor, from the time he left his house in the morning around 6 a.m. till the time he got home at night, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., somewhere in there, he never shut his truck off. Like, ever. If he went into the shop for a meeting, that truck was out there idling in the parking lot. If he stopped for coffee and donuts, the truck sat outside idling while he went inside to get his food. Stop at the McDonald's drive through for lunch? You betcha. He sat there idling that engine while he ate his lunch before he got back on the road. Oh well, rules for thee but not for me. Wedding reception call. Happened about seven years ago. I was no longer help desk but in a system admin role within the same company. Habits are hard to quit for some people so I'm often reached out to like a tier one help desk. It was Sunday, the office was closed and my fiance, parents and some other family members were checking out a venue for our upcoming wedding. I dropped everyone off and drove off looking for a parking spot. As I circle around looking intently for parking, my phone rings. Since I'm on the hunt for a free spot, I pick it up without looking, figuring it was someone I dropped off spotting a parking space. It wasn't. It was the CEO of my company with email issues on his Mac. I screwed myself. If I looked at the caller ID, saw it was him and ignored it, he would have tried calling another team member or my boss, etc. Because I picked up, I'm stuck. Now I have to help. The issue was his gigantic email database on his Mac was corrupt and needed to be repaired. So as I'm meeting with the venue managers, seeing all the areas of the venue and going over the potential setup of our wedding reception, cocktail hour, etc. I'm walking the CEO through how to repair his database. Painful to do on the phone and with him. I get him to the point where we have to wait an extremely long time for the database to be repaired. I was thinking, great, let this run and I'll call him back. Nope. He asked 100 questions. How long is this going to be? Will I have all my email? How can I do work email while this is going on? Etc. I tried getting off the phone with him for 20 minutes, but he kept coming with the questions. I got off the phone and reached out to another team member to call the CEO and check on the repair. It took hours. The CEO used webmail while it was being repaired. I did see the venue and liked it. My fiance was very understanding. It was the venue we picked in the end. Lol. Update. Some of you must never have dealt with VIP users with huge egos. There was no good or correct answer I could give. I've been there. You're right. There is no good answer for most of those VIPs. They need attention and they need it now. Undivided attention. I'm, I'm surprised you got away with looking at your own wedding venue. Just wait till you try to have kids and you're at the hospital for the birth and you get that phone call. I suggest leaving your phone in the car or ignoring it. It's 2 a.m. Backstory. This happened more than 10 years ago. During summer, my uncles got my grandmother a new-to-her computer, which she didn't want to use. I pried, and she said that she was too old to use a computer. I disagreed. I showed her some basic computer tasks, like how to turn it on, using the mouse and keyboard, how to get logged onto the internet, some basic internet safety, shortcut to news sites, and other simple-for-us-but-hard-for-them tasks. 
She was most excited that she could read the news anytime, not just when it came on the TV. She took a computer class a few weeks after I had returned home to learn more of what it can do. It's important to mention that she lives in a different time zone but has always been mindful of this when she's called. Story. After a long night of test prep, I go to sleep exhausted. I'm rumming hard when my polyphonic bar phone goes off. That thing was loud. It took several seconds to pull me out of sleep, but I looked at the calling number and the time. It's from her area code. Now that part of the family never calls at these hours unless there's an emergency. Armed with this knowledge, I perk up and answer the phone. Me, sounding nervous. Uh, hello? Grandma, as happy as could be. I sent you an email. <laughs> Me, confused. What? Grandma? Grandma. Yes, I sent you an email. I figured it out. Did you get it? Me, so glad it's not an emergency. It's two in the morning. What? Grandma. No, I did the math. It's two in the afternoon. Did you get my email? I decided to turn on my tower and log on. Indeed, I see an email from her. Me. I do see an email from you. That's cool. Now I can email you anytime. Grandma. Well, I hope I can figure out how to write one back. You really got it? Me chuckling. I did. Grandma. Thanks for showing me that I'm not too old to use the computer. I have to call your mother. I sent her one too. Me. You're very welcome. But Grandma, it is actually two in the morning here. Maybe wait a few hours before calling her? Grandma. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Must have done the math wrong. Me. Don't apologize. I'm glad you called. We hung up shortly after. She did end up calling my mom at 6.30 a.m. I guess she couldn't wait any longer. Edit. She lives in a different country, so my midnight is her morning. She usually calls in her evening, so she's used to catching us in our afternoons. In class the next day, the professor noticed I was unusually tired and confronted me. I told her a summary of my night and she allowed me to retake the test. I thanked her, but frankly I was fine with the less than perfect, but passing grade I got. I am enormously proud to this day of my grandma for being able to email on her own and I would never give up that 2 a.m. phone call. She's had to stop using her computer due to her legally blind status, over 80% blind. Well, congratulations, OP. That was so heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. But really, you know, good for you for sticking with her and, you know, showing her that she really wasn't too old. I sort of get it. I mean, I'm only 52 right now. And uh, sometimes I feel like, ugh, learning something new, really. But I, I actually enjoy learning new stuff, so I don't think it's going to be quite as bad for me. But if it's something that scares me or seems overly complicated, I can see where, you know, in another 10, 20 years, I start getting a little edgy about stuff like that. Sorry to hear the grandma had to stop using the computer, but hopefully uh, hopefully she got a good 10-year run out of it and maybe, uh, and maybe figured out another way to get her news outside of TV. I'm not crying. You're crying. PhD needs to be rebooted. I was working IT support on a large military base. The section I was assigned to had many important people in it. People with lots of horsepower, let's say. One of my customers had multiple PhDs and was reportedly the highest paid VIP in the building. He spent all day every day doing research on his computer. He'd been doing similar work for about a decade. One day he calls me to ask me to come to his office as he's having a problem with his Windows 10 workstation. So I walk into his office and ask him what the issue is. He starts describing what is a very common problem that I've seen thousands of times and is always solved instantly by rebooting the workstation. So I tell him to reboot his workstation. He looks at me like I've got three heads and just mutters, huh? So I tell him to restart his computer. He starts frantically clicking around various spots on the desktop, nowhere near a start button or any icon. It finally dawns on me, this incredibly overeducated guy earning more in a year than I earn in 10 years has no idea how to use a Windows computer, even though that's literally what he's overpaid to do. Yes, I literally restarted the computer for him. Yep, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love my PhD and master's peeps. They're great at what they're specialized in. They're very smart when it comes to their field. But I wouldn't trust most of them to cross the street without somebody holding their hand. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Oh, that's Quarter. Quarter's a little twitchy. She just had her uh, epilepsy medication not too long ago and kind of wore her out. So I guess it's nap time for a while. By the way, some of you will be glad to know that I wore an actual t-shirt today to cover up the hairy shoulders that offend so much. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you guys, but really, that's not the hill to die on here. Trust me. It's a thankless job. Until it isn't. Since there was a post detailing sweet experiences with users appreciating work done, I felt I should add to that simply because we really don't see enough of it. 
As I've said before, I work for a fairly large school district as an L1 campus tech. Because of how large our district is, somewhere around high teens and campuses and swiftly growing, we don't have enough techs at the moment to give everyone a single campus. The high schools and middle schools have enough problems on their own that they require a single dedicated tech on campus every day. The elementary campuses do not have close to the numbers that the above do, so techs will get assigned multiple campuses to take care of through the week. I recently was given my third campus to oversee, which just so happened to be the week after spring break, which came after two weeks of delays due to weather and state testing. So when I say I was backed up on tickets due to being unable to work on them, I'm saying my open ticket numbers were almost starting to rival that of one of the middle schools. The week this story describes was my catch-up week. From the moment I walked in the door to about two hours past lunch, my feet were in constant motion from classroom to classroom. This campus in particular was extra unlucky as my day to visit them happened to be the days that we froze over and school was canceled. So needless to say, they were really hurting for tech help and I was really hurting to get my numbers down to a point that I no longer feel pain when seeing them. It was around 10 a.m. on this midweek day and I had closed well over a dozen tickets by this time, most of which were your standard issues. My projector doesn't turn on or my student's Chromebook won't turn on or even Susie Q dropped her Chromebook and now the screen's coming off. I was in a daze and entirely functioning on autopilot. My attention was shot, smiles were faked, and conversations were very brief because I was truly exhausted from all the work the week had brought me. This next ticket on my queue talked about a student having an issue with a testing app, stating it was taking much longer than normal to load. No big deal, let me swing by and check it out. When I stop by, I find the kid and ask him to show me what was going on. I immediately learned this kid was very smart when it came to figuring things out, simply because he power cycled the Chromebook using the key combo refresh plus power. And I'm still teaching the teachers how to do that. He shows me the app and how it's not loading properly. So I take the Chromebook and head back to my office. The best thing about these Chromebooks is you can just hook it up to the network and power wash it to reset it. It's like five button presses in about a minute or two at most. Typically this solves 75% of the issues I come across and I was hopeful that this was simply something that could be solved by it, so I reset it and tested the app again, since the machine is set to have the app installed based on the profile defined by the network. I boot the app up, and sure enough, near instant response. Well, cool. Job done. On to the next one. I bring the kid his Chromebook after, at most, three minutes, and they're shocked to see me so quickly. I explain what I did and ask the student to test if all is working, to which I got a happy confirmation. All is good, and I leave to work on the next thing. You might be wondering where the happy part of this story comes. Well, here it is. On the way out for lunch, I'm on fumes at best. As I'm approaching the door, the teacher of that previous student passes me and goes, Hey, my kids think you're a wizard. That student was convinced he wouldn't have his Chromebook back for a while, and I told him that you were really good at your job and that you get things done really fast. It's these small things in life that make it all worth it, really. I did end up getting my ticket numbers down after that week, but honestly, I wouldn't have gotten it done as quickly without that interaction. It's kind of nice to hear the good and wholesome stories once in a while. You know, we like to laugh and chuckle and grit our teeth at all the, you know, inept users or the people that are just so impatient or self-important that, you know, they should be first. It's nice to know that there are people that appreciate what you guys do. And uh, I appreciate every tech I've come across except for one. This was a call-in tech support issue that, yeah, it was a nightmare. I'll have to share it sometime. It's not all thankless. Years ago, I was working tech support at a theater, the play kind with a stage, not a movie theater. And I started dating a woman with a teenage son at home, and he didn't like this new guy stealing his mama away from him. Well, I was newly divorced and living my best life, so I had booked a World War II tour of Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands, a full immersion event where we dressed up in uniforms, joined an armored convoy, and slept in foxholes. Well, that sounds romantic. At the end of the tour, my new girlfriend joined me for a week while we did our own tour of Benny Lou? Ben Lou? I don't know. And afterwards, we headed back to the States together to resume our regular lives. I had parked my car on the ramp across the street from work and took the train to the airport. So the first thing we had to do was go to the theater and pop by the office to get my keys. My girlfriend's son met us at the airport and drove us downtown, as this was the longest time he'd been without his mother and didn't want to waste a single minute when he could be chatting with her. When we got to the theater, they decided to come inside with me as it's a beautiful space and every person we ran into was unabashedly happy to see me and gush about how much they had missed me. From staff wandering through the lobby to the receptionist at stage door, to random people in the hallway, to my boss and coworkers once we got to the office, all gushed on about how much I was missed. Although to be honest, 
The team was just happy they didn't have to cover my duties anymore. By the time we left, the kid decided that the guy dating his mother may not be so bad after all. Well, that's cool. It can be tough on kids, man. You know, my parents were divorced when I was younger, and uh, when my dad was thinking about getting remarried and my mom was dating, it, it was a little weird for me, you know. I guess some part of me thought that that other person was trying to step in and take over the role of either my dad or my mom, depending on which side it was on. I guess it depends on how old you are, but, you know, as long as they kind of stay in their lane and realize that they're not going to take over as your parent unless the need arises. You know, if you, if you have a parent that passed or is no longer in your life in some way and they step in and help fill the parental role without being obnoxious, eh, I guess that could work. And I'm rambling. Total grandma type. So this is a short and sweet story, but I love spreading positivity. So I get an email ticket from one of our users yesterday. Very brief. No body. Subject just reads VPN. I email back asking for more information. Asking for error messages and things like that. I get a reply once again with no information, just reading broken. Great. One of those types. The ones who are so impatient that it isn't worth their time to write proper emails. So I call the number in their signature and brace myself for the shortness, rudeness, impatientness, etc. The user answers the call with the sweetest old lady voice you could imagine. Hello, this is username. Hi username, this is OP with company name. How are you today? Oh, hello OP, I'm doing much better now that you're calling. Do you think you can fix my problem? I was surprised. Been a while since I've heard that much sweetness. Well, I'll certainly try. Can I jump on your computer to take a look? Absolutely, please do. Do whatever you need to. I hop on and start taking a look at the issue. Goodness, I can't believe how fast you're going. You IT guys always impress me with how smart you are, especially compared to stupid people like me. Hearing her put herself down like that broke my heart. Hey now, I say, we don't use words like that. I just have experience. If you guys didn't need help, I wouldn't have a job. It's not your job to know how to fix this. A few minutes later, I solve the issue and get her working properly. You already finished? Yes, ma'am. I've seen this issue before, so I knew how to resolve it. I can practically hear the smile in her voice. I'm so glad you guys do our IT now. Our last IT provider was horrible, always rude, and took so long to get back. Thank you so much, OP. You've been a really big help. Lady, you're going to give me a cavity. The next day, I got a review back from her as my company sends out automated reviews once a ticket is closed. The review was marked overwhelmingly positive, and the text read, my new best friend OP got the issue fixed lickety split. Fast, friendly service. That's why I love company name. Keep it up. I'm still riding the high off that call and wanted to share as it's experiences like this that remind me why I do this job. For every rude customer out there, there's always going to be that one that makes it worthwhile. Wow, two in a row. There really are a lot of people that appreciate what you guys do out there. I can't say we because I'm not a tech guy. Um, I help with tech, but I'm not, I'm not a tech person. I'm not help desk. I'm not tech support, whatever. I just like technology and try to learn where I can, but I do appreciate most of the people that helped me. There was one exception a long time ago. I don't know. I think it was Dell support. Oh, never again. Somehow I did enough searching online to trip across Michael Dell's personal office, not personal, but his office phone number, direct phone number, got his personal assistant and had a new laptop for my wife the next business day. That was amazing. Never talked to Michael Dell, just talked to the assistant. But uh, yeah, so that was nice. But the regular text that I dealt with that day, not so much. How can you mess this up? I'm a teacher. I'm good with tech because I like to try new things. Today we were emailed a zip file with results from a recent standardized test. The file contained three Excel sheets. Neither my coworker or my principal, who sent the email, could open the Excel sheets on my coworker's computer. They asked me to help because when it comes to actually using most software programs and all Google for Education programs, even our school IT will sometimes call me. I opened Excel and opened the file just fine that way. Coworker thought I was going to copy and paste the data. Nope. Opens just fine when you use the correct program. Somehow in 2022, in a Google for Education district, he still uses Internet Explorer as his default and apparently opens all attachments through IE. I have no idea how he managed that. Well, there we go. There's one of the users we were just thinking about. Honestly, I hate Internet Explorer. I hate Edge. I hate Outlook, Outlook Express, anything to do with Outlook. 
The Windows environment, generally, I have no problem in dealing with. It's just all the other side Microsoft things that just drive me absolutely bonkers. What about you guys? Those of you that use Windows, what do you think? Save your work. The server's on fire. Many years ago, pre my IT days, I was doing a business administration course. And one day, someone I didn't really know popped their head around the door and said, save your work. The server's on fire. Oddly enough, as the only person who saved their work to a floppy disk in the 90 odd seconds before the fire alarm went off, when we returned a few days later, I was the only person who still had the data from that day. The guy who A told us to save the work to something that was on fire, and B didn't bother with minor little details like the fire alarm was nowhere to be seen. Yes, in retrospect, we obviously should have just gotten out and not saved anything, but particularly when you're younger and less cynical, if you're told there's an emergency and to do something quickly, you just do it. Also, even when I thought about it, I thought it would either be a remote server, rare as they were for small places in the 90s, or at least in an outbuilding. Nope, he went and told people to do something extra at their desks while the computer, server, and rapidly the building were on fire. Sure thing, building's on fire, let's all save our work. Maybe tidy our desks before we go home for the day, huh? Genius. The ultimate band-aid. So this is from within the last 10 years. I was an intern for a government organization at the state level. We had an issue with the network going down every morning. It was tied down to a server that was freezing up every morning. We had a pretty large department with its own dedicated network team and all, so quick fix, right? Oh, no, no, no. This was a government job. Band-aid fixes all around. Rather than find the source of the issue, the network team nominated a guy we'll call James, can't remember his actual name, to come in every morning at 6 a.m., clock in, restart the server, then take a nap until everyone else arrived. It worked, and this happened for like a month or two before management started asking questions like, why are we paying James so much overtime? Why is there a sleeping bag in the office? And did I just see James getting dressed in the break room? Is he sleeping here? Oh God, he's living out of the office? If it wasn't for that last question, I'm pretty sure they would have kept that band-aid on for years instead of just fixing the issue, which they hammered out within days of James being called in on suspicion of living in the office. In fact, I think it was fixed the same day after that. Wait, it was either the same day or the day after. It can't be the same day after that. That's... I don't understand. Well, the cat twitched a little. That's about all she did. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So, the next week or two is going to be a little bit sketchy as far as the schedule goes. We're going to get videos up, but they may not be quite in the same spacing that we're all used to. <laughs> um, uh, my my other business, my soap and cosmetic and whatever business, uh, we have to change locations. So our retail shop and manufacturing has about nine days to move, relocate, and reset up. So yeah, bear with me. We're going to get it done, make things happen, but uh, it's going to be a little nuts. So, oh yeah. We got quarter with us today. Still twitchy, but not quite as bad as the other day. Don't ask for help if you don't want to be helped. I've been working in tech support, level one, for less than six months. I work for an organization, so my customers are technically my colleagues. I'm still new to the job and industry, but I've realized that people have a superiority complex when speaking to tech support. Today I had a call from a staff member who couldn't connect to the organization Wi-Fi. I asked her to try forgetting the network, usually Wi-Fi credentials just need updating, and she said in the most condescending way that she couldn't. She omitted information so I had no choice but to keep asking questions so I could assist her better. But she would say things like, what do you think I'm calling you for? Duh. Obviously. How would I know? She would interrupt me while I was explaining possible solutions and she'd immediately say, no, can't do it. When I'd got her on where to go and what to do on her laptop. She also left me on the phone to mingle with other colleagues for three minutes. By the end of the call, she told me that she hadn't, prior to calling support, attempted to connect to the Wi-Fi at all. Uh huh? Edit. End of this story is that I asked the technician to go over to her as I had had enough of her being rude to me, so I wanted to terminate the call. Though even when I suggested this, she still found a way to complain about it. Awesome. I've had colleagues tell me I'm wasting their time when I can't solve their problem in 30 seconds. I once assisted a colleague with locating a link on a website because he couldn't find it. Instead of just saying thank you, he dragged the situation by telling me it wasn't there, put me on a loudspeaker, said my name very loudly, and told me that I was wasting his and another 30 people's time as they were in the room with him. Yay. I am these people's colleague, and yet I feel so disrespected. 
Don't call tech support if you don't want to be helped. I'm not a wizard. It's not fair that I feel like I can't be frustrated because I wasn't able to solve someone's problem when they didn't want to cooperate. Yeah, that's not just tech support. Anybody that feels like, you know, if you play a support role for anybody, that goes for janitorial, maintenance, tech support, the guy from the mailroom, they all seem like they're, you know, subservient to everybody else in the building. And they all tend to get treated like crap. So don't feel alone. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be upset about it. Just don't feel alone. That's all I'm saying to you. Misery loves company, right? Your grandson isn't here, but I am. I started to learn software development as a teenager. Thanks, Internet. And was called the computer guy in my family, even if my brother, twin, almost had the same knowledge about the computer that I did back in the day. I was just able to code some small software, scripts, and a web page. After my bachelor, I went to some IT and development classes, and it went worse. Way worse than I expected. I was bored by the basic stuff. I was far from home and family. I had no money. Was eating once every two days. Worst year of my life so far. I tried to keep up, but the depression was here, and worse every day. Until I definitely gave up and go back home one month before the end of the school year and skipping last exams. At this point, I chose to put my computer away for a while and spend my summer with my family and a lot of time with my grandma, as she wasn't far from where I lived at the moment. I was getting a lot better when she died three months after I gave up my classes. I think I'll never be as much broken as at that moment, to be honest. But I'll not talk anymore about this, as this is enough for the story. I don't know why, but I tried another year in university. IT stuff again, but close to my home and a not-so-good university, to be honest. I met a lot of people there, but I went to class for like one month before giving up. I still went to university to meet friends and work with an organization that was creating geek events around the city. It was a bad year for my professional experience, but a good year for my mental health, but still had to work with IT stuff for these events. I definitely left school after that. I was a bit naive and thought that my knowledge was enough to get a job. Wrong. I spent almost two years after that working for a small organization. The goal is to help people get a small job, but for cheap costs for people or small companies. The biggest part of that was old people asking for help for manual tasks because they couldn't do it. I met some nice people doing that work and was searching a web development job aside, which gave nothing. And this is where the good part of the story comes in. Before I came to this organization, they knew nobody that could handle IT work. So when someone asked for help with their computer, they told them they can't send someone to help. When they knew I was searching a dev job and was good with computers, they asked me if I could handle IT problems, and of course, for me, it was more experience. More job, more money, full win. So the next time someone called for help with their computer, they sent me. And this is where my story starts. Yeah, more backstory than an anime. They called me one day for someone not far from where I lived that needed help because he couldn't get to his webmail. I said I could go that afternoon, no problem. I go to the man's house, small house just outside the town, I knock and the guy told me I was quick and showed me what's going on. I go to the webmail page and yeah, blank page. I try an incognito. Yep, it works. So I check extensions. It was the ad block that was causing the issue. Five minutes and it's done. I told him about that and he said it was his grandson that installed the computer and he can't do much without him. But his grandson went on the other side of the country. As he talked about his grandson, I remember my grandma, previous year if you can keep track of the time. And I started talking about her to him. After all, she lived less than 10 kilometers from him. Maybe he knows her. And I talked about my grandfather's brother, who was living not far from here either. He died when I was young, and my grandfather died when my dad was young, so I don't know them really well. And then we talked. I spent the afternoon with him, for five minutes worth of work. To this day, I still stop to meet him every time I drop by and help him for free if he needs to. That was the first time and last time I did IT with this organization, as they quickly understood that IT problems will often be less than 10 minutes worth of work, not worth the effort for the low price they were charging people, less than $20 an hour. There was a lot of backstory, not so much IT, a lot of English mistakes, but I'm reading a lot of your stories, and now that I work as an IT sysadmin, I have a lot of bad stories, and I wanted to share a good one. Eh, your English wasn't that bad. Hey, between your bad English and my bad reading skills, it still sounded alright, huh? We made it through. I need a file from my laptop. One of our executives and VP were on a business trip together and realized the presentation they had prepared was still on the VP's laptop that he didn't take with him. <laughs> Phone rings. Me. IT, this is BamBam67. VP. 
Bam Bam, please help me. I need a PowerPoint file for my laptop. I'm away from the office. Me. Sure, VP. Is your laptop still here at the office? I can remote in and send you that file via email. VP. No, it's not in the office. No? No, I left it at home. Me. At your house? VP. Yes, can you please connect to it and retrieve the PowerPoint file on my desktop? <laughs> Me. Is your laptop turned on and connected to the VPN? VP. No, it's turned off and in my home office. Silence. No, really. In over 25 plus years of PC support, I was a bit taken back. Stay calm. VP. Hello? Can you get my file, please? <laughs> Me. I'm afraid I won't be able to do that. No, why not? Me. Trying to keep my composure. So, you're asking me to connect from the office to your laptop while it's turned off and in your home office. VP. Yes, please. Me, preparing myself to ride the wave of logical thinking. I'm sorry, VP. Unless your computer's on, connected to your local Wi-Fi, and logged into our network via VPN, there's not much I can do. VP. So, you can't connect to my laptop? Unfortunately, no. I can hear muffled discussion between VP and exec. VP. This is very important for our meeting. I really need that file. Me. I'm sure it is. I put my thinking cap on. VP, when did you last work on that PowerPoint and did you happen to send it to anyone via email? VP. I did. Suddenly our executive jumps on the phone. Exec. Can you please jump on VP's email and find that file? I'm sorry about all this. Sounding very apologetic. Me. Absolutely, Exec. Put VP back on the line and I'll log in my PC with his account and forward you the file. Executive, thank you BamBam67 and thanks for your patience. I was able to log on to VP's account and access his email and even converted his file into a PDF and sent both to the executive. I saw both VP and executive a week later. Both were all smiles. I'm assuming the meeting went well. I like when it's a happy ending. Remember, no matter how ridiculous the request, use your IT powers for good. Well, at least they weren't super nasty and demanding, even if they were lacking a little bit of basic knowledge and understanding of how VPNs and remote access works. And good for you for thinking about the email thing. That was pretty sharp. Customer wastes the workday of my boss because no one wanted to try my troubleshooting step. This particular incident occurred while I was working as a tech support for a company that sells popular NAS storage devices. Everything is paraphrased and summarized. I'm kind of just getting this off my chest. I got a call from a customer who worked as a technician at a popular local zoo. He was calling about the NAS device being unreachable despite being on. It was unreachable by all machines in the network, including devices in the same subnet and on the same switch it was connected to. As a first troubleshooting step, I had him directly connect via Ethernet, a laptop to the NAS device. The NAS was reachable normally by the laptop using this method, so we know the network stack is working on the NAS. We tried checking the switch to see if there was any rule blocking the NAS from connecting. We didn't see anything. We tried connecting to a different port on the switch to see if it would connect. It still wouldn't connect. We tried resetting all the settings on the NAS to default, in case there was something on the NAS blocking the connections. It still wouldn't connect. At this point I suggested trying to reboot the switch because it was connecting through the laptop, but it just wouldn't connect when connected to this switch, even though there shouldn't be anything in the switch that's blocking it. I'm called an idiot and he wouldn't take down 20 other devices just to test this case, and I remember him saying, you know that rebooting the switch won't do anything, it's obviously a problem with your device. This case escalates to my boss. At this point, I was on call with him for over three hours. After an hour of talking to the customer, boss agrees to bring a new NAS device to their location. Said zoo was literally 30 minutes away. He goes there, replaces the NAS device, it's working. Comes back, case closed, nope. The next day, the same dude calls back and I pick up his call again. Surprise, new device isn't reachable anymore. Same symptoms as yesterday. I ask if he's tried rebooting the switch. Get called an idiot again, escalate to my boss. Boss drives out there again, comes back at the end of the workday, says all they had to do was restart the switch to get the NAS to connect. I write a note in our internal ticketing system about how, if the customer calls back with this issue, he needs to contact the switch's customer support and not us. Call me an idiot once, that was your last shot. You ain't talking to me again and you ain't getting any help. If you know so much, do it yourself. Who's on call for IT? I'm typing this on a desktop with a full keyboard so I expect you to judge my spelling and formatting harshly. I'm not IT, but I'm one of those unofficial go-to guys at work because I'm good with technology. I'm an RN who used to work night shift. 
If the IT guys actually knew how many middle of the night calls I stopped people from making, they'd buy me a pizza or something. You know, they're on call, so I should call them even though the solution is a reboot 99% of the time. It took us a long time to break people of that habit. Instead, to not call someone in the middle of the night unless it's truly important and prevents you from doing your job. One such situation was about 1.30 a.m. I wasn't called over, I just happened to be walking by the nurse's station and overheard someone ask, who's on call for IT? Me. What's the problem? Her. I can't get this computer to turn on. When I push the power button, the screen stays black. A quick glance to the tower to see if the front power button was lit, and the problem was obvious. Me. Well, it probably won't turn on because there's no computer there. The space on the desk just to the right of the monitor where the tower had always resided is bare save for the unplugged ends of several cables. Her. Oh. Yeah, that's a problem. Of course, she's probably one of these people who thinks that this big square thing in front of you that shows all the pretty pictures is the computer. And I'm quite sure she couldn't use the excuse that, you know, she's used to all-in-ones because evidently she'd been there for a little while and there's always been a tower in that position that's no longer there. Like, I guess she's just used to turning on the monitor and everything's just there. Amazing. Well, hey guys, I hope you like these stories today. If you did, let's keep the fun going and check out this video right here. See ya.